everyone welcome back to ghostwood twin peaks podcast uh was it here higa league a multi day gig hitter harold's skies hey they a multi day young hitter dan sprouse and of course so, yeah. take my hand charles let's join hands <laughs> there we go hey leg so what the hell are we talking about? Well, obviously we're talking about the, one of the deleted scenes on the Twin Peaks fire walk with me criterion edition. One of the missing pieces, which was of course a great moment uh, with Ray Wise, Grace Sabrisky and Cheryl Lee in Probably the only time the Laura or the Palmer family was ever actually happy, I think. Well, that we've seen. No, that we've seen, that we know of. Right. Presumably, they had they had to have at least one more more happier moment than that. I would think. True, and and Laura talked about some happy times in the diary, but this is the happiest we've ever seen them. Yeah, yeah, because so it makes this. Go ahead. It makes this scene okay. kind of sad because. We know this family can be happy, but we also know that terrible, terrible things are going to happen to them. Exactly. Well, yeah, because obviously, yeah, we've we've watched Fire Walk with me by now, the regular version, and you know, without the missing pieces, and we've watched the regular series, the original series. So yeah, we know it's not going to have a happy ending. We know it doesn't even really have a happy story. No. So, um, so it's kind of weird and a little unsettling, but yet it's kind of a tad uplifting too, I think. It is. It it's is. It's like, nice. It's like to know oh, they at least had one decent moment in their lives. That they have little things. They have small victories. That's yeah. a good. That is good. That's all you can ask for in Twin Peaks are small victories, frankly. It's, exactly. And this was a scene uh, where uh, Leland is trying to teach Norwegian to uh, Sarah and Laura so that they can introduce themselves to the Norwegian group that's coming. To the uh, great. This Northern. is before we know that the Norwegians are leaving. Exactly, because Audrey shakes fist. Audrey. Audrey, first you, and she's off, Audrey, getting, honey, off, kind of Audrey. like he, 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 in the corner. Is there something wrong, young pretty girl? Yes, very nice. Uh, so yeah, so he's trying to teach them how to say like uh, hello, and you know, my name is. Yes, hello. How are you? My name is. Yeah. So if you're wondering what kind of gibberish we were spouting, that's this was our at least my pitiful attempt at Norwegian. I think it was you, my I, I think you sounded much better than I did. Um, I was trying to quote, so yeah. I don't know which yeah. one of us. Was, I think you probably came better out better because phonetic. you you did it phonetically, and I was trying to follow the how it looked, you know, the pronunciation as it looked on the paper. So I think you win. Right. Right. So. Uh, but yeah, obviously we're going to talk about the Criterion Collection Edition of Fire Walk With Me. This is our second attempt at this. So hopefully we can get through this yeah. one this time. Me uh, too. Yeah, so um, obviously we've talked about uh, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me before. So there's no point in going over that again unless you really, really want us to. But um, we do have another episode where you can like listen to all that stuff. But uh, obviously this was a screenplay by David Lynch and Robert Engels, directed by David Lynch. And this Criterion version came out on October 17th of this year. And we're just now finally getting around to it because. So. Um, because Zan was in Australia. Well, Zan was in Australia. And then, like, my world just completely blew apart last week. So. Send some messages of love to Charles. He's having a rough time. Yeah. I think my cat is having the rough time. I'm just uh, trying to be supportive. Well, that's that's all you can do for kitties. Just yeah. scritches and snuggles. That's all you can do. Yeah, exactly. So, and uh, lots of KFC, apparently. Oh, is that what she likes? She loves, she is addicted to KFC because, you know, her daddy, 
brings some home like on Wednesdays after getting comics and whatnot to watch, you know, like stops by KFC. Okay. And that's the thing, you know, so she loves her KFC. Can't I had a cat enough. who. She's a junk food junkie, our Keiko. That have Lord have mercy on me. Exactly. But uh, I had a cat who, um, her thing was Arby's. So my parents would do, well, my dad would, would do the five for, back then it was five for five dollars, regular roast beef. Right. And uh, cat, cat always got one. So. Very nice. <laughs> I got this today, too. Ooh. What is that? This is the Twin Peaks Season 3 Blu-ray set. <sighs> yours came today? It came out today. Yours, yours came today. You got it today. Yeah, well, I picked it up at Best I Buy. I went up to Best Buy because apparently yeah, Amazon... Well, I pre-ordered Am- it, so because mine it, should have been here. Well, here's the thing. Amazon apparently back-ordered everybody because... They did not order enough, or in the, and the uh, the um, oh. CBS didn't make enough because they didn't anticipate demand properly. So a lot CBS of has been stupid with Twin Peaks forever. So thankfully, yours truly went was planning on getting it from Best Buy, and apparently Best Buy has it. So you have to try. Oh my go. gosh! So I got my copies today. Lame. Yes. Yeah. So there's so there's secret Dougie underneath the sh- the uh, uh, so that is ridiculous. So lots of people were That's not had. Cool. Obviously, uh, there was a bit of a uh, uh, higgledy piggledy on the Twitter machine about this today. Yeah, I uh, have not been on the Twitter machine today, so I haven't I haven't seen that. But yeah, I yeah. am now. Yeah, if you do it like a hashtag Just Twin Peaks, I- yeah, you'll see a lot of like. You know, Bez- Jeff Bezos. You know, fire yourself stuff posts. Well, if it's if CBS didn't make enough, that's not Bezos's fault. No, but, but it, it's kind of hard to say where the the blame lies. But so. well, and everybody loves to hate Jeff yeah. Bezos, right? So, but it's a good sign that well, hey, if they CBS made a certain amount, but they didn't anticipate demand. Uh, so I guess if like Dave Lynch and Mark Frost really, really want to do it. New Twin Peaks season, I'd say this is probably a good sign. That, that if they happen. just want people to give them money, I mean, that will happen. <laughs> yeah. So, Well, yeah, I've had I've had issues with CBS um, and their home video releases because I'm a Star Trek fan. Oh, God. And, yeah, serious. And, and the gouging and just the, the releases and weird packaging and all kinds of stuff. So... It's, it's, well, don't even get me started to on the the special editions of Star Trek. Yes, yeah. where they've gone back into the 1966 series and added special effects and crap like that. Don't even get me started on that. Right. Well, part of me likes right. part of me likes that depending on the episode, but it's, it's no, nice. it's, I don't like it. You it's don't not like what it? it was. It's not what it was. No, it. Uh. Maybe clean up some bad film stuff. Right. But don't add planets and stupid crap like that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's not like what it's not like what Lucas does. They just like make the effects better. They make the effects better by redoing the effects. Yeah. I mean, I'd say like clean up any sort of film problems, but don't like add planets. Don't make a digital enterprise. Don't right. do that. Just make it look nice. Yeah. You know. I will say the packaging for the Twin Peaks season three is is actually pretty nice. So, yeah, I'll bet it is for people who got it, Charles. <laughs> Zana's staring daggers at me. You suck. I'm so bad you right suck. now. I like completely forgot what day it was. Yep, it's Twin Peaks Day. It's Twin Peaks Day, and I'm sitting here like a chump with nothing. You got the podcast. That's something, right? Well, that's true. That's pretty good. That's that's pretty darn good. I hope At least so. I still I have hope, everything I hope, on the, I hope yeah. it's good. I'm, I'm feeling a little. It's insecu- very good. I'm feeling a little insecure right now. Oh, don't feel insecure. Right. No, no, no. Okay. The podcast is way better than a, than a Blu-ray. I All will right. say that. Okay, just check. But it'd be better if we both had the Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just uh, come on over and we can watch Twin Peaks. There we and go. You, you watch all these all these cool special features. So if nothing else, I've got it. If you want to like burn through this stuff, so um, all right. So anyway, back to Criterion Walk with me before I totally ran us off the rails. Um, so uh, we had 
Now, we talked about this in our first attempt, that we there were some similarities and differences among the Blu-rays from the yes. entire – what's on the entire mystery Fire Walk With Me discs and uh, what's on this Criterion release. Um, I mentioned that, you know, like I was happy that uh, at least on the Criterion version, I didn't have to wait for Paramount's pre-menu nonsense, um, that uh, the picture was better. I thought on the criterion version and uh, you know, that um, we got, we did get those new Cheryl Lee and Angelo battle of interviews, which was nice, but there's a lot of stuff that yes. I think, but I, there's a lot of stuff that I think is missing from that was in the entire mystery collection that should have been in there. I think so too. And I think that when it comes to criterion, this is, on the bare bones end of what they usually offer. Right. And I don't know. See, I don't, to, see, I don't normally get criterion. So I'm kind of, so I'm guessing you do. So, well, yeah, I'm so, a criterion. So, junkie. so, so, uh, so as far as a, a criterion fan, you would consider this a poor release. I would consider this a, a bare bones release. Okay. So, um, so, nothing so criterion a, 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 a mediocre release for them. I see. Here's <laughs> this is the thing. I I do. I love Criterion. I'm a total Criterion geek. If I have a movie and it comes out on Criterion, I buy it a second time. Right. And I love foreign films and cult films, and that's what Criterion does best. And they've done some very – everything they do is going to look beautiful. That is the one thing you can always count on Criterion for. It will look and sound gorgeous. Okay. Uh, it will also have good packaging. I've never seen anything Criterion that didn't have good packaging, but they have different levels. They have, you know, they have something like this that I would consider the minimal. The, 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 what do you think of someone who does the bare minimum? Yeah. This is the 15 pieces of flair. Right. Okay. <laughs> they, they have 32 pieces to, of flair releases as well. To put this on the office space scale. On the office space scale, this is this is definitely the bare minimum fifteen pieces of flair. Okay, it's 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 acceptable. It's fine. You get to keep your job. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we if people want to do more, well, then we encourage that. And they have done releases that are th you know, I, for me, when it comes to Brazil, no, not for, that I spoiled my own thought here. Yeah. When it comes to Criterion's upper echelon releases i think I, I always come back to brazil okay that's your that's that's your your like uh the top of your list yes that as, is as the, as the best that is the best release the, pin the pinnacle yes probably after that is probably picnic and hanging rock because they brought the book back into print in the united states for that release okay so i like that and that's the thing they're multiple discs they come with extra things they really kind of dig into the vault but this is like we said before, you know, we had the missing pieces. We've had this released on DVD before. So there was not a lot to pull from to put on this release. Right. We did get, but that I new, think we did get the new booklet. Yeah, you know, the new booklet. We did get the new booklet. And the new booklet, which I found, by the way. I Yay. Decided, yeah, you had lost it last time. I tried to read it. And then, of course, I couldn't find it anywhere. So, <laughs> um, and I think I said this last time when we were talking is that I, this is the one thing that I, um, I'm always sort of like mildly disappointed with because it is Blu-ray sized. Yes. I would love it if it were a larger book, but it's still pretty good. Yeah. Um, well, obviously it's, it's a really cool it, book. They want it to fit cool. inside the packaging, which makes sense. But Right. You have to fit inside the packaging. And as the, as the packaging gets smaller with Blu-rays, it is going to be smaller packaging, but yeah. I still love it. I especially love the inner cover, which is. Oh yeah. That the uh, painting. Angel. Or, yeah. The angel. Yep. It's angel painting. It's not the it's not the doorway painting. No, no, it's no. The, it's the, it's angel the painting. Wall. Yes, the other one. The angel painting. Yeah. So yeah, the book is the one fantastic. where the one the where the angel fantastic. vanishes from the painting. Yes, exactly. The one where the angel vanishes from the painting, and the book and the interviews are are definitely make this a worthwhile purchase. It is definitely worthwhile purchase. The original release of the DVD of Fire Walk With Me is definitely one of those bare bones, you know, special feature scene selection, which this Criterion release does not have. Right. So you can skip through it, but you don't know what you're skipping to. Yeah, that, so, that was one of my gripes. that you can also say, that, why would you... Yeah, I was going to say, that was, that was one of my gripes, too. Yeah. 
yeah. sorry, sorry to be so, to talk over you there. That's all right. It's hard. It's hard to. It's hard to tell who's talking when you're when you're on a bad video connection. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've, I keep getting these pop ups going. Your video sucks. Yeah. So. All right, so we'll we'll so, try and get through this. Okay. Hopefully, it doesn't affect the audio. As long as it doesn't affect the audio, we're good. Because hey, you know, you can't see our podcast unless we put up on YouTube. Thank I guess, God, all you it. podcast land can't see us. Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend me at all. Zan, Zan's lovely. So, but, well, I'm sure you're lovely too. Just right now, you're very pixelated. Yeah. So I, I, that's the, that's the problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this is the Atari 2600 version of me. This is the eight bit Charles <laughs> that we have right here. So, <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, so um, yeah, so we we got to cut. We we're missing some documentaries, and uh, but we did get some new interviews. So it's it's uh, I think overall, I think the entire mystery is the better release. But but obviously, if you're like looking for a better picture and uh, a couple more interviews, it's, it's a good. It, it, the Criterion release, I think, is a good companion to the missing pieces or the uh, entire mystery. I think so, the entire mystery, but I also yeah. think did was was Fire Walk with Me on the entire mystery? Yes, it I was. didn't think it was. Yeah, it was. Was it? Not? Yeah, the, the the Fire Walk with Me gets a disc, and then there's a second disc of Fire Walk with Me special features, including the missing pieces. I remember the special features, but I remember them all being together, yeah, just then, as one big. No, it's two. Pieces. It's two oh. discs, on the and the missing gotcha. people, or, or in the entire gotcha. in the entire mystery. Yeah, I got to revisit that. Yeah. So. Uh, so, but, but but yeah. So I think it's a good companion piece. But if but if it's one of those like, well, I've got it. Should I go ahead and spring double dip? You know. Yeah. I think yeah, that's. You should. I think it's yeah okay yeah it's if nothing else for the better pic- better picture. Yeah, and I definitely think you should. Once you get this, you can get rid of your old one, right? Your old original original DVD. Right. If you still have it, right? You can just put like take this out of the Criterion package and put it into the <laughs> entire mystery box <laughs> and swap it. <laughs> there you go. No, I just no. I mean the original Firewalk with Me only single disc. Oh, oh, oh the, the, the original DVD release. The original DVD release of right. Firewalk with Me by itself, yes. Unless you're like me, I think, which you just keep all, every single Twin Peaks thing you've ever owned, because, yeah. <clears throat> that was me, too. I had the to keep, there the were hoarding, things on the, the hoarder. Well, collector. If collector. it doesn't have rat poop on it, you're a collector. Ah, I like um, that. That's the distinction. So That's a good, that's yeah, important you, distinction. If, if it doesn't have rat poop on it, and you know where it is, then... Like if you can find your birth certificate, then you're fine. Um, because I remember the gold box had things that is are not on the entire mystery. Right. Yeah, I, don't, hmm. I, I, I can't remember if the Saturday Night Live sketch is on the in, in the, it's entire on the gold mystery. Box. Yeah, it's on the gold box. Yeah, it's not the entire mystery. That's why I haven't box. gotten rid of my gold box. That's exactly why I haven't gotten rid of my gold box. Because I'm keeping that that Saturday Night Live sketch. Did they have the anything but love sketch on that too? Oh, I don't. I don't I can't remember. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't remember. Anything but love was a sitcom with Richard yeah. Lewis and Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, I don't, th- I, don't, a, I, don't think, a, I don't think. I don't think they have the Northern Exposure homage either. Yeah, I don't think so. Northern Exposure was interesting too because Northern Exposure was kind of where we all migrated to after Twin Peaks was over. Right. Like okay, Weird Town and then no, we, yeah, we okay. we we had X Files and we had Northern Exposure. That's what the two of the it took two of those shows to replace Twin Peaks. It's, yeah, right, and it didn't. It did. It didn't even come close to filling the void. No, because here we are, twenty six years later, still talking about it. Because we we spent the next quarter of a century whining for it to come back. So please come back. Yes, we did, and it and it worked. And you know, hey, so hey, whining pays off. But I will say, we can talk about this booklet for a little bit since yeah. we did say this is probably the most unique thing that we yeah, please do took a look at, and the. This is an interview and photos, still photos, which honestly, still photos were much, much cooler before we had videotape (laughs) back when we had, uh, you know, all we had were photo novels and trading cards and stuff like that. But we had all those those grainy videotape VHS images. Right, right. 
So the, you know, the interview is actually very interesting because it talks about David Lynch actually growing up with a log lady and how she was this woman around town who would carry a log, write things in a notebook and she would, she was part of the sawmill, but she looked like she was walking and like touching a log. And then like the log was talking because she would touch these logs and then write, write down what it, it looked like. It was writing down what the log told her. Right. So that was very interesting. And you think Cause you about always, something. Cause you always wonder like how many of these characters were influenced by real life. Well, and that's the thing when we hear about this woman and then we know that when David Lynch was a young boy in Missoula, there was a, naked lady that just showed up on the street one day yeah, that just walking around that obviously influenced blue velvet i'm guessing that was blue velvet right and so you think you know when everybody talks about oh david lynch is so weird he's such a weird guy and it's like well wouldn't you be yeah you know i mean when you were eight some naked woman showed up and everybody's just like huh what do we do now yep you know so he comes by it honest you have to give him that so apparently we owe twin peaks to a naked lady that showed up on david lynch's door at eight when he was eight well, yeah, that's true. Twin Peaks, Partially. Blue Velvet. Well, Blue Velvet for sure, and then Twin Peaks we owe to this woman at the sawmill who was doing apparently quality control. <laughs> <laughs> but still, kudos to David Lynch for having an imagination about that. So, <coughs> yeah. But yeah, my favorite thing about the Log Lady's log was that you know he had his little arms that stuck out. You know, like hey, I'm still in this log. <laughs> so that's great. Yeah, I love that. All so yeah, the booklet right. is definitely worth. Uh, the interview is definitely worth reading. Um, mostly what I thought was interesting was that, you know, how much of this weird ass town was actually stuff that happened that David Lynch had seen. Yeah. So, well, I mean, the, the bit, a writer, a good writer writes what he knows or he, or she knows. And, uh, you know, you draw from those real life experiences Now you can obviously change them, but, and, and enhance them, but, uh, but it's a good foundation. I think starting from truth is a very good foundation right. now because you, know, you just, it's, it's, it's sharper in your mind. You, you have an idea of what it is and you just have to get it down and, and how to explain it to the, it audience. has an air about it. Yes. So, yeah. All right. So, uh, so we might as well talk about the missing pieces because we didn't really yes. talk about those in, during our fire walk with me discussion. Now I think that, no, we did not because when we talked about the movie, we just talked about the movie and we didn't talk about yeah. anything extra. I, I think we talked about like Philip Jeffries and that was pretty much it. Right. We t and we talked about all the things that we said after seeing the return that we thought were really strange and really obtuse. But now we're like, OK, I get it. And I think that was part of including these scenes on this release because we are fresh from seeing the return. and. Watching these deleted scenes, again, you realize how much the return was taken from Firewalk With Me right. and how, how important Firewalk With Me was. And I think, again, that was David Lynch's way of saying, no, this movie was good. Everything about it made sense. Everything about it is important. So you need to go back and rethink, what you're, rethink your review on this. Yeah. Because when I first saw these missing pieces when the Blu-ray of the television show of the original series came out, I thought, okay, well, this is just more of the same. And now that I'm seeing it, I'm like, Oh yeah, that's right. Oh my God. I forgot about this. And I forgot about that. And there were so many things that connected everything. Yeah. It, now, it, it, we've, we've talked about this, about how it feels like it matters more now after watching right. return that, it, that it fit, like it, you actually see how it fits into the overall puzzle. Right. You see how it fits. And, you know, and I, I should have known because we can just jump right into the deleted scenes and I'll start in the middle. There is a scene where it's, it's an extension of that scene where Laura comes over to Donna's house. Right. And, you know, the, I, are you my best friend? She comes over crying and they just sit there talking, but you see Laura's interaction with the Hayward family and how, her parents really just adore Laura as well, that she's a member of their family, you know, and Doc Hayward says, why do I, 
why do I not allow smoking in my house, but I let you smoke when you're here? And she says, because you love you, you love me so much. And he says, I do. And, and then he tells her that when you see the angel, you will, you will cry tears of joy. Yeah. You said you weep with joy. Uh, or the angels will return. And when you see the one who's meant for you, you'll weep one who's with joy. You, okay. Yeah. And when I saw that scene, I started to cry. When I first saw that, I was like, oh my God, this makes, that makes, of course, the last yeah. scene of Firewalk With Me makes so much more sense. And it makes her, that's why she seems so happy and not, well, and like, like she's looking at that angel, like she recognizes it. And now we know yeah. why. Yeah. Now we, well, she was almost expecting that angel. Well, the thing, and you're, you're talking about the best friends edit scene, by the way. And yes. so the, um, the, what makes this scene, I think, so important. And I kind of wish it was already it was left in the final cut, is because remember when they're in in the uh, in the pink room, and um, she Laura is telling Donna you know, like, or no, she's talking to um, Jacques, and she's getting ready to lay one on him, and she goes, "I am the muffin," you know, like he goes, "I am the great yes. wit," and she yes. goes, "I, I am the muffin." It. So here in this best friends edit scene, we kind of get, you know, where Laura is telling Donna, Donna, you're the muffin. Right. And then it's only like, well, when she leaves that, uh, you know, she leaves Donna's house in the, in the next um, deleted scene where she, we, she's talking about like, no, 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 Donna, you're right. I'm the muffin. I'm the muffin. And this was uh, often when I see deleted scenes, I think, okay, I can see why this had to go. But this one, I really think would have been beneficial. Yeah. yeah because I, because, in- because watching the, yeah, just the actual um, final cut that uh, you're like, what is she talking about when she's talking about like, I'm the muffin. I don't get it. What does she mean? Well, they're high, they're drunk. It doesn't exactly. matter what they're well, saying. Right. You could, but, but it gives but it, more but it, meaning matter, but it matters it. more now. It gives more meaning to it, and it also, I don't know, and the scene, and then, of course, the ending scene with the angel, I think that just makes it so much more poignant for Laura. Yeah. Having been told this by Dr. Hayward, who, Laura, I think deep down, Laura wanted to be her father, too, because her father, as much as he loved her, couldn't be her father for her because he wasn't himself. He wasn't, he wasn't all there for her. Right. That, um, well, just, yeah, because she w- she was best friends with Donna. She got to see how Donna interacted with her father. And I think she was right. probably a little envious and jealous of that. Well, and he's, he's such a, he's such a loving person. He's such a nurturing right. person and he's so accepting, you know, you would think that a small town doctor who's, yeah. who looks very square would see, you know, James Hurley come over in his, in his motorcycle with his with his leather jacket, he'd be all like, you know, stern about it, but get, get off know. my lawn. Right. But you know, he's like, is that James on the phone? Tell him to get over here. Mayday. What the, who the hell ever heard of diet lasagna? Like <laughs> he just he's sort of accepting of anybody that Donna wants I to forgot, bring into I her life. I forgot about that scene. That's a great scene. Yeah, diet, who the hell ever heard of diet lasagna? <laughs> just to see, it was so funny to see uh, Doc Hayward, Warren Frost, just kind of ranting about something. It was pretty funny. Well, and I just love how even when he comes over for dinner, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's a motorcycle rebel guy, but he's a genuinely polite kid. And the parents aren't really looking to size him up. They just want to get to know him because Donna likes him. Yeah. And I think that this is part of their parenting is part of why I, it's so, so worrisome what happened with Gersten, yeah. you know, that that's breaking their heart. Yeah. What happened to her? Yeah, yeah, and, and, we'll, and we're going to get into that once we get into the uh, the final dossier. Yeah, we because, are. Which will be that's that's a tale, one of many. Yeah, so, that'll be fun. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but, stay tuned. Yeah, stay that'll tuned. Probably be that'll probably be a two part episode because that book, while there, short, there's a lot we have to go through. Yeah, to talk yeah, about. We're, yeah, we're going to have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheriff, we got a lot to talk about. Sheriff, we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, we, yeah, we have to break that up kind of like we did with the mu- the uh, soundtracks. Um, all right. So yeah. uh, you want to r- randomly, pick, you wanna yeah, randomly pick some uh, scenes that you liked or you want me to just run through them one by one? I'll, I'll do well, one. Well, that was my favorite. But just go ahead and go to the beginning. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's see here. 
was my copious note, copi- my copious notes here. I started with chaos, and now you can. No, that's you okay. Can um, I can adapt. I'm I'm good with some chaos. It's good. It keeps <laughs> things spontaneous. I'm alright. It does. I like yes. that. All right, so uh, we start off uh, with Desmond's mo, and uh, we have Agent Sam Stanley and Agent Chester Desmond leaving the morgue after performing that autopsy of um, of. Uh, oh, can't believe I'm blanking on her name. Teresa Banks. Ter- Teresa Banks. Thank you. Uh, it's been a long day. Uh, all right. So, and uh, they're talking about, oh, it's just, it's nighttime. So that's that. No big deal. Uh, the next scene, say hello to Jack, uh, where they say it's um, Sam and Chet. They talk to Jack, the owner of Hap's Diner. And we get kind of like a extended scene where they meet him. You know, where the where you have the flickering lights. Right. And uh, they're so, yeah, they're asking him about Teresa Banks and Jack sends them to Irene, who apparently was Teresa's supervisor. And uh, we at the in the finish cut, there was only like the tail end of that part. Right, right. And this was one of those that I felt didn't necessarily need to be no. any longer than it was. Um, it's, you know, more Lynch. I'll never I'll never turn down more David Lynch. But at yeah. the same time, it's not. I don't feel like it, it didn't, it wouldn't have detracted, but I don't think it would have added. No, no. I mean, Jack wasn't exactly an essential character to the plot. So if something had to be cut, it, um, this was fine. As far as I totally agree. Uh, we get next scene. Good morning, Irene, where, uh, Irene, it's like the next morning and Irene's, I guess she works third shift apparently. Uh, and so it's daylight. They, she goes into a car out in the parking lot. And they say good morning to her and uh, referencing Jack's discouragement of saying good night, Irene, (laughs) as she gets into her car and heads home. And she's kind of sassy to them because, hey, it's Irene. Irene is kind of sassy. Yeah, exactly. So there's that. So that was kind of a like an easy scene to cut, I think. Now, one scene I what I kind of wish was in there was the next one. This one's coming from Jay Edgar. Yes. And this is the big, like, uh, Sheriff Cable versus Chester Desmond fight. And so they, now, if you watch Firewalk with me, you know that Cable and the whole Deer Meadow Sheriff's Department are essentially giving all kinds of attitude to, um, to, uh, Chet and Sam, uh, trying to basically almost like, almost getting dangerously close to obstruction of justice in this. I think they're actually at obstruction of justice. You think so? Point. So, yes. so Chet's finally had enough and Cable's had enough. So they kind of agree to take it outside. Fisticuffs. Yeah. So, and of course you get Cable trying to be like, Oh, I'm a big man. Here I am bending the rebar. Uh-huh. Er, cable, then, cable bends cable. And then we get Chris Isaac taking off his suit jacket and rolling yeah. up his sleeves. And then I forget what happens because I'm just looking at it. At this and point. then he goes, baby did a bad, bad thing. Baby did a bad, bad thing. Yep. Yes. Because uh, somebody's crying. Feel, yeah, it feels like <laughs> crying. Yep. Oh, my gosh. Yep. Patience is the night. Oh, wait. <laughs> wrong, series. wrong series. So no, I I love Mr. Sam just kind of drifted there for a little bit. I'm not going to lie to you. I think he's a he's a beautiful, beautiful man. Yeah, shakes yeah. fist here. So. Pretty. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, he's he's cool. Uh, I I actually, you know, I've seen Chris Isaac in concert. I got nothing against Chris Isaac. He's great. Oh heck yeah, he's good times. He's great. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, so they get into it. Um, Chet easily handles. Uh, cable i'm just like just like basically like tries to kind of take a couple punches just to kind of lure him in and then just bam 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 done done yeah exactly and then he goes over and picks up and bends his own rebar right and he says who's next who's next yeah who's next because yeah because the other two like the the deputy and then the receptionist or whatever you know, right. They were giving him all kinds of attitude as well and acting all snotty. So he's just like, I forget okay. her name, but I, I think of her as the evil Lucy. Yes. So. Yeah, she's the anti-Lucy. 
she's the anti Lucy, right? So they're just giggling and expecting yeah. this to go the yeah. way it always goes. Right. And uh, nope. Nope. So that was pretty funny. So I so I kind of wish that scene was in there, just because it's so satisfying just to watch Cable getting his clock clean. It is very satisfying, but again, when you have a movie where there's so much interesting going on, I can understand something like this just sort of. This is a side. This is a side path, and too many side paths make things slow down. But this is extremely satisfying and very funny. So it would be kind of nice if we did get at some point an extended cut. That would be so great. But you know, yeah. there's, there's certainly enough material for it. So oh uh, yes, and, then and so, with David Lynch's name on it, no Alan Smithy cuts. Thank you very much. Yeah, I totally agree. I agree. Uh, next scene we get is the big one with Cooper and Diane, where we. Almost finally sort of get a taste of like, or just a glimpse of like the actual Diane, not just Diane with Cooper talking into his dictaphone. Not just a tape recorder, actual Diane. Yep. Yes. And uh, so, yes, actual Diane. Although, of course, we don't see her, but it's, we have Cooper standing in a doorway acting uncharacteristically cocky, I think. Well, they have this. It's a fl- like a like a flirting relationship, but well, obviously, yeah, well, obviously, well, they yeah. have this every morning where she changes something in the office, and he needs to notice what it is. So he's noticing things about her, like to, you know, te- that to just, test his powers just, of observation, I guess. That's right, the, to test his powers of observation, and he he's looking around the office, and he says, "That dress is lovely on you, and you haven't changed your hair, so it's something else." So it's not a it's not a creepy situation where he's being really kind of flirty, but it's no. more of a, um, all right, let me do this. Like it's more that he's being cocky about his abilities rather than being like an asshole boss or something like that. I agree. So, I agree. Yeah. It's so yeah, what does the clock move four inches to the left or something 12, like 12 that? Inches to the left, yeah. 12 inches to the left. Yeah. 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 Right. So something really subtle. And that gives us some insight into Cooper's yeah. ability to, talk to Harry for, you know, five minutes and meet Josie Packard and then say, how long have you been in love with Josie? <laughs> you know, Cooper, Cooper notices things. And so this is another reinforcement of that. Exactly. Part of his- so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't think it's, it was necessary to keep the scene, but, uh, but it was a fun scene. Right. I don't think it would have detracted, but I think it might've been fun. Again, this would be, would gr- this would be great on an extended cut. Right. This wouldn't have necessarily added to the story because we already knew this about Cooper, that he yeah. has. Yeah. But it's always fun to watch him be like Sherlock Holmes, essentially. Yes. Yes. He's he's way less cocky than Sherlock Holmes. That's for yeah, sure. That's true. Dep- especially depending on the adapta- or the uh, actor playing him. But yeah, generally, yes. Uh, well, I don't think even, even in the even in the in the books. No, in the novels. Yeah, there's Arthur Conan Doyle he's, novels. He does have at- he does have attitude. He is arrogant. Yes. He's pretty sure that he's smarter than everyone he meets in the world. So. Yeah. Uh, next scene we get is uh, Sam Stanley's apartment where we have Cooper talking to Sam. So this is something a little different. Right. Um, so we kind of get understand why Cooper has like tells, um, you know, that Diane to go to Albert, his team. Don't oh, go Albert. To- yeah, go, exactly. Yeah. Go to Albert. Don't go to Sam. Yeah, so this is probably where he kind of gets a little his prejudice against Sam a little bit. Well, and I think Sam is Sam obviously shows himself as being a little too eager. Right. You know, did you, did you meet Lil? Not going to talk about that. What about the Blue Rose? Can't tell you that. You yeah. know, he's very much. Yeah. He's trying. To, he's he's trying. He's being the Chester to Cooper Spike. Yeah. To, to bring it back to Looney Tunes, Warner Brothers. <laughs> hey, Cooper. Hey, Cooper. Did you yeah. see that girl with the dress? Huh? Did you meet Lil? Did you meet her? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Hey, Cooper. So I think he's just he's so eager and Cooper needs is trying to sort of just slow him down because he's obviously not ready for yeah Rose's task force. Yeah, probably doesn't think he's mature enough. No. Um so uh so yeah, of course Sam's awkward around Cooper. Um and yeah, you like you said he's asking about Lil's blue rose. Now here though, Sam asks, shows Cooper the T found under Teresa Banks's fingernail. Yes. So we kind of get the first thing that sets Cooper on his case. Right. Concerning, right. concerning the, uh, the murders here. So it's, he's kind of been, um, this is after, of course, after Chet has vanished. So here's Cooper taking over and yeah, he gets his, basically his first real lead. 
Yes, he does. And it Sam makes a point of showing him that machine he was carrying all around Washington and saying, you can't find anything without one of these. Right. Well, Cooper in the first episode of Twin Peaks is obviously in another small town with another small town morgue and its technology. But yep. Cooper knows what he's looking for. So Cooper knows to look. Yes. That's why he finds the R. Yeah. So I think, so this scene I think could have been in there because it does, it does kind of flow into why Cooper took over them. What happened when Cooper took over for Chad? I think so too. And it also shows you that Cooper, it shows you Cooper's interaction with Sam that would have led him to say, go to Albert and his team. Don't go to Sam. Yeah. I think because it, Albert, it does fill in a gap. Sorry. Albert can find anything. He just doesn't necessarily, I don't get the impression that Albert knows what to do with what he finds. So he's good at finding the information, but I don't think he knows where to go from there. Right. But, that's, a, Albert, but, but that's okay because Cooper, you know, he's the one that kind of connects the dots. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. So next scene is Buenos Aires. Look so, out. Yep. At, above the convenience store. So, um, we have Philip Jeffries in the hotel, lobby of the hotel in Buenos Aires, the Palm Deluxe. Palm Deluxe. And the concierge gives him a key. Now, interestingly, after you've watched The Return, Jeffries asks if there's a Miss Judy at the hotel. A Miss Judy at the hotel, yes. Yes. So uh, we are going to talk about Judy a little bit here. Uh, concierge responds by giving him a letter the young lady left, whoever the young mm -hmm. lady is. We never find that out. No, we don't. And yeah, we don't know if he's talking about Judy or someone else entirely. Judy or this, is, this would have been 1988. So yeah. I have no idea who yeah. this could possibly be. Exactly. Um, we kind of cut away to the convenience store meeting uh, where we have the arm better known as the little man from another place. Um, yes. Um, where the arm says the chrome reflects our image from pure air. We have descended. Right. Now this is what I want to talk about right here. Yeah. Okay. And these are, again, these are scenes that I think would have been good in the movie. First of all, any more David Bowie would have been fabulous. I would have right. taken any. David Bowie. <laughs> can yeah. never ha can never have enough David Bowie. No, you really cannot. This scene I thought was interesting considering what we saw in episode eight of the return right. where right. they do come from air. They are sent from the lodge in this ethereal spiritual. Yeah. Spiritual fog. This, yeah. Other dimensional. Yeah. Right. Right. It's, you know, that, that it sort of filled, it sort of filters down. So I thought that was very interesting comment that he made on that. Well, the, the, the comment that I think is really interesting here is where he says, um, after he says from pure air going up and down, he says intercourse between the two worlds. Yeah. So, what, so yeah, essentially, yeah. So essentially he's talking about the bridge between these two. I'm worlds. going to eat fries, lower horn. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have a, uh, a black woodsman who now that we know what the woodsmen are. Right. Uh, he says animal life. Mm -hmm. He's also the one that says electricity. Uh, yeah. that's, that's I kind of thought it was that guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that guy. And uh, then we have Bob who says, and I kind of like this quote from Bob. I have the fury of my own momentum. And he does because he is sent to Earth with from the right um, from the experiment from the from the experiment yeah. in his own dirty smoke with right. Garmin Bozia all mixed up in it. He's yeah. his own thing. Yeah, so I kind of love that. I kind of like this quote from Bob. I think it's very fitting and descriptive. I do of too. It. So, I do too. Uh, so I kind of like that one. But uh, so that's kind of cool to get those. Uh, we kind of get more with Jeffrey's rant in the FBI office. The what? only thing I didn't like about this one, and I think it could have been put in there. Right. The only thing I didn't like about this one was him actually saying out loud it was above a convenience store. Okay. You thought it was a little I, too on, on point or on the nose? I felt like it was a little too on the nose. But then again, the only reason we know 
that is because of the return. So I think I'm seeing it a little bit with return clouds over my eyes. Yeah. I think maybe in 92, that would have been... I think it would have been been helpful to understand. Yeah. Because because there was was that comment in the original series, like they lived above a convenience store. Mike and Bob, yes. Yeah, when Mike was was kind of channeling in front of uh, Harry and Cooper and whatnot. Right. And Albert. So, uh, so yeah, I think that, I think that would have begun a long way to kind of connect those two. I think so too. And I think it would have been something that once we started seeing it in the return, we would have been like, oh yeah, that's yep. right. Cause that doesn't look like it's above at a convenience store just from, I mean, would you expect above a convenience store to look like. I would think just like, like, you know, like, okay, like like the attic of a convenience store. Like somebody's ratty kitchen. You know, I don't, I would expect that. I don't expect there to be four mica tables above convenience stores all the time. No, unless this was like an old building where like maybe they had like a meeting room or something up top. Or it was one of those things where it was like a general store and the owner lived above it. Yeah. Kind of a thing. But it was, you know, they didn't talk about that. And at the time in the Mm -hmm. nineties, you know, conven- now convenience yeah. stores, we, we think of those as being connected to gas stations. Yes. So we don't have that sort of dust bowl image of the general store with the apartment above it kind of a thing. Yeah. Certainly not like we were introduced to in the return, which the that kind of right. retro, like right next to a gas station kind of thing, that all in one encompassing uh, service. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> All right, so uh, so we've got Gordon saying, "Where the hell have you been, Jeffries?" And Philip says, "I sure as hell want to tell you everything, but I ain't got a whole lot to go on. But I right. will tell you one little itty bitty thing. Judy is positive about this. What is she positive about? We have no idea because we're still not going to talk about Judy. We're still not going to talk. And Albert's like, "Huh? How interesting. I thought we were going to leave Judy out of it." Albert. Which is a great, which is a great Albertism. Perfect Albertism. Yes. Yeah. And so, so basically they sit him down and then Philip says, uh, listen, listen up, listen carefully. I've been to one of their meetings. It was above a convenience store. And Albert's like, okay, who's meeting? Where have you been? Right. Gordon says, Jeffries, you've been gone for damn near two years. And then Philip's like, well, it was a dream. We live inside a dream. a dream. Which is one of the best quotes ever from Twin Peaks. And then we're like, oh, ah. yeah. Yep, yep. And then Albert, perfect timing, says, and it's raining post toasties. Albert is such an ass. <laughs> which is a really obscure reference to an old cereal, post toasties. Post toasties. Post, post, really post cereal was, a, it was like, you know, like. It was, it was the like, corn. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, Kellogg's or whatever of the day, Post. Right. And they post had this... for their version of, of uh, yeah. Cornflakes, which was copyrighted by Kellogg's. Right. So, so it was pretty fun. So that was pretty fun. Uh, Phillips, and Phillips great here. He's like, hell God, baby, damn no. Uh, <laughs> which I think we need to start saying. <laughs> right. I, th- I think I need to put that on one of the audio clips on my phone. <laughs> that needs to be on a T-shirt, too. Exactly. <laughs> hell God, baby, damn no. Damn no. I found something in Seattle at Judy's and then there they were and they sat quietly for hours. I followed. And then he's like, puts his head on the desk and he moans kind of oddly. And he says, the ring, the ring. Yep. This ring has more to it than we are even close to knowing. Yeah. And then Albert and Gordon tells Albert, Albert, I'll take that second mineral water. (laughs) <laughs> so he gets Albert out of the room. Yes. And then he turns to Philip and says, Philip, let's calm now, down now and get this interesting story on paper. Right. Because, yeah, uh, Gordon tries the phone, but the lights flicker. And then he's like, hello, hello, get me, hey, some, good, me. Get me some good news. Give me some good news. Which is a very David Lynch's quote. It Co- is. Cooper, the device has gone faulty. Can anybody hear me? Mayday, Mayday. <laughs> Which, if you've read uh, The Secret History of Twin Peaks, Mayday from Major Briggs. Oh, yeah. Right? 
That's right. Everything's connected. It's all connected, people. So. Don't ever think that Twin Peaks there's don't ever think that there's something in Twin Peaks that did not have a lot of thought behind it because no. you would be wrong. Yeah. Even if you have no idea like how it if it's ever gonna get a payoff, it's just it's, wait. It's there. Just, just wait. Just it will just wait long enough, someone something will happen. <laughs> Somebody will connect it. Somebody will connect it, it'll be fine. So yeah, uh, Philip says, uh he, this is where I think he kind of realizes that he's time traveling here. He says May you know, because he starts off repeating May Day. He goes, May mm-hmm. February, 1989. Yes, but it's 1988. Right, it's 1988, so that hasn't happened yet. And Gordon says, what, am I alone in here? And he looks over, he's gone! He's gone. And the last thing here we hear is just Cooper going, what? That's it. Yeah. Which well, right, and you know, he does still come in and look at Cooper and say, who do you think that is there? So yeah. we still yeah. get the idea that Cooper is not what he seems. Right. And then we go inside Bob's mouth for some it's reason. Good. Yeah, that's not good. Because, good. because dude, you know, seriously, tartar control. Check into it. Well, you know, that's the thing. It's when you're an evil entity born of vomit. <laughs> there well, are some things... well, you know, all that Garmin Bozia leaves a stain. Seriously. Right. Um, Get some crest white strips or something. Come on. Something. Yeah. Um, so then we see Jeffrey's teleport onto the staircase in Buenos Aires. Right with the with the scorch marks. Yeah, and he's like in severe pain, and then we like he sees like there's a maid in front of him stumbling away, while a porter proclaims he has soiled himself. Yes. <laughs> and while he's asking where Jeffrey's went, and he screams, "Ayudame," or "Ayudame," something like that. It's Spanish for "Help me!" over and over, as Jeffrey starts screaming again. Yes. So, and then Jeff Priest just goes up and kind of goes up in smoke. And then we're like, David Bowie, come back. Come back. We need come you. Back. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, side note, yep. side note, I saw a David Bowie shirt at Hot Topic while I was shopping for my nieces. Uh huh. This close to buying it. Oh, I don't. Close your fingers, Charles, and go back <laughs> and get it. Tempting. It was very tempting. I know, it right? Tempting. It was a pretty cool shirt, too. I should have got it. But I got something else, another shirt instead, which I am get? going to surprise on you at some point. Oh, okay. Yeah, mystery. Ooh, suspense. Very exciting. Yeah. I think you'll get it. Because, I appreciate it because as a Ferris Bueller fan, you should appreciate it. Did you get the Sausage King of Chicago shirt? No, no, no. Something else. Oh, but something else. Gotcha. Yeah, something else. Um, so uh, next scene is Mike is the man. Mike is, is the man. The man. And this is just basically an extended version of the Bobby and Mike scene. Uh, but this one lets you know that Mike is in on this drug ring that they've got going on. Yeah, because they talk about like giving Leo, they owe Leo five thousand bucks, right? And, and they need their cocaine supplies running low. So, right. so we yeah. know that Mike is in on this too, right? See, that's another thing about Dr. Hayward. Even though he doesn't like Mike, he tries to be nice to him for Donna's sake. He's well, yeah. a really nice guy. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. You're gonna, he's not one of those guys like, you know, well, I, I don't know. Maybe he would be. You know, and maybe he maybe he's given Mike the, you hurt my daughter, I'm going to break you in half speech. Right. Seriously, you hurt her, I'll kill you and make like, it look like an I'm, accident. I'm a doctor. I could kill you and get away with it. Exactly. I'll do your <laughs> autopsy and say it was natural causes. <laughs> exactly. And everyone will believe me. Yep. You know that promising football career? Well, hey, I could cut your tendon and you'd be done, son. Then you're done and you have to go, I don't know, sell cars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, that's what happened. Oh, wait a second. Yep. So maybe Doc Avery could cut his tendon. In the <laughs> if we don't know what happened. I mean, that would be pretty funny. Yeah. Um, I mean, we know that he'd be very fitting, fun. but. Although he won. Wind up killing Benjamin Horn, but that doesn't mean he didn't uh, mess with Mike a little bit. Yeah, there's obviously a dark side to Doc Hayward. There, there's still some stuff about that we're not sure about. Yeah, and, this, and especially after you've read um, the final dossier. Right, that's there's, true. There's a, some that's stuff there, too. All right, uh, next scene is school books, where we have Laura running down the stairs to discover someone, after discovering someone, ripped pages from her diary. I wonder who it could be. I don't know. I won, and then her mother's coming in with yep. groceries, and so she's helping her mom. Can I borrow the car? And yep. so 
she runs out and is gone for a while because she goes over to Harold's yeah. house. We probably, know from, that. probably from that same grocery store that we saw her in, in the return. Right, where she's just buying liquor. Yes. <laughs> and, and like getting all kind of upset about the beef jerky. What does she ask about it? Like, is it is it organic or something like that? Something, what, like, what was, something like that. I, yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. Actually, I forget. Um, but uh, I guess Laura asked to use the car, claiming she forgot her books. Sarah gives her the keys and takes away her cigarette, warns about her about smoking. Yes. Which, if you don't. You won't be a smoker if you don't start. <laughs> right. Look at your mom. Yeah. She's like five packs a day. Because <laughs> if I had a nickel for every cigarette your mom smoked, right. I'd be dead. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, next scene is the Palmers, where we, we kind of talked about this. Uh, but I did love the moment where Leland comes down the stairs and he's stomping around like he's a big lumberjack guy. Yep, he's just stomping. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Hello. Laura. I where's my axe? I'm hungry. <laughs> Which is just great, great wise. And it's like, and you, part of you wonders, like, you know, in any, you think about this in any other situation, you're like, wow, this is like the goofiest dad I've ever seen on TV. And then other part of you knows like, yeah. oh, this is not really him. It's it's like, it's just anytime he does anything weird and goofy dad, like it's just scary because you know, it's probably Bob. Right. And it makes it all the more tragic because you know that it, there's that darkness yeah. underneath. Right. So it's yeah, like, exactly. like he starts off with like being wacky sitcom dad. Uh huh. And then he's like, okay. I'm the special guest villain on Criminal Minds this week. And then he's like horrifying too many cooks, Dad. Yeah. Like, just really scary. Yeah. So, uh, but the, again, this was a great scene. Oh, and uh, let's see. But here's another thing about yeah. this scene that I really liked. Yeah. What's Laura eating? Oh. Or more importantly, what's she not eating? Oh, is it broccoli? Or no, asparagus. Yeah. Asparagus again. Asparagus okay, again for asparagus. dinner. I hate asparagus. Does that mean I'll never grow up? Yep. <laughs> uh, next scene is... I, I loved that. I loved that little nod. Yeah, that was to, great. Uh, to the uh, diary. Next scene is a quick one with Laura's part called Laura's Party, where she sneaks out of the house and meets a trucker and exchanges sex for drugs. Yes. So, because that's how she bartered. And who is that trucker? Good question. I don't know. It looked like Brad Dorif, but I forgot to check... Was it Brad Dorf? I didn't. It looked like him. I'll have to check. But that, I, I could be wrong. I could I, very well, I could, very well be I wrong. Could, I couldn't place that guy, but maybe you're right. Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't put it past you know that being Brad Dorf. So uh, you could be right on that. Uh, next one's called Two by Four, which is this really odd scene where Dell Mibler, yeah, that old guy from the the Twin Peaks Savings Alone. Oh yes, the guy that walks at like point zero 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 one miles an hour with the with the uh, Harry Carey glasses. Yes. Yeah. So, so anyway, he shows up at the Packard Sawmill and he's complaining to Josie and Pete that their two by fours are not exactly two inches by four inches. And Josie does not understand that that's like normal. Right, but Pete's there. Pete understands. She's like, Pete, I don't know what happened. I don't know why this is happening. And yeah. he's like trying to explain it. And then eventually he says, at your bank, is a dollar worth what it used to be? And then he's just sort of like, ah, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Light bulb. Ding, 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 ding. ding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, so. we have pierced the void. Yes. Again, the scene was adorable and funny and would not have detracted from the movie, but I don't necessarily think it no, added to it. No. I've, I would have liked it if only just to get Pete Martell in the movie. Just to get more Pete Martell. Anytime there's more Pete Martell is a good time. He is. He was always one of my favorite characters on Twin Peaks. Yeah. So, it so, it so it's, it's so disheartening to know that he passed away before he could come back in the return because I would love to have seen him in the return. All right. Uh, next scene is kind of quiet, where we have kind of an extended scene in the Double R Diner with Laura helping out with the Meals on Wheels. Yes. And we see Heidi. Heidi. Yeah, we see Heidi with a bloody nose. Heidi has a bloody nose. Yeah, she had that in the movie, too. 
Oh, that's right. Okay, but we yeah. yeah, we get a little bit more of that. And Ed and Nadine come in for coffee, but as soon as they walk in, Nadine sees Norma working the counter, and she gets all pissy and runs out. I don't want coffee anymore. And you just want to say, Nadine, who the hell did you think was going right. to be there? And Ed Nadine just, owns that place. And Ed's just like... Or, we, like Norma owns that place. Yeah, and Ed's just like, we got here. There's like three waitresses, and she's one of them. Of course we're going to see her. Yeah, exactly. So, we live in Twin Peaks together. All of us still are still right. here. Come on. Come on. Where are we going to go? It's not like we have a McDonald's, apparently. So... Uh, the only place anybody eats in this town that I've ever seen. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, Shelly sees Laura uh, staring at the place where Mrs. Tremond and her grandson were standing. Uh, Laura <laughs> runs away, and then Shelly goes back in the diner. And then Norma sends Shelly to go do Laura's route, because she took off. Right, Laura just took off. Yep. And then um, the cook, I can't remember his name, uh, he peeks in and he talks about how the diner's quiet because there's like nobody in the diner. Yes. And Norma's breaking down because like, hey, her business is apparently failing. Right. Nobody's in there and she doesn't have Ed. Right. And then Ed comes back and oh my God, do I love Ed so much. He's so sweet. Yeah. He apologizes He's to her. He apologizes to her. He's just trying to do the right thing by everybody. And he just, it's so hard for him. Yeah. He's like, come on, you see what I got here. <laughs> you see what I have to work with here. Yeah, you see what I have to work with, Mr. Napier. <laughs> yep. But nerves went completely severed, Mr. Napier. Mirror. And every time I <laughs> hear that, I think of Lisa Simpson. Oh, totally. Totally. Where she's got the braces, the old, like, yeah. Plan. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa's got braces. Or Dental Lisa needs braces. Yeah, Lisa needs braces. <laughs> Don't play it. Don't start this with me. I we'll know. Yeah, we'll, we'll totally go down the Simpsons rabbit hole. But that's one of my favorite all-time Simpsons scenes. Absolutely. Uh, okay, we talked about the best friend scene, so we'll skip that. And we kind of talked about the I'm the Muffin. Yes, I'm the uh, Muffin. Scene, so we can skip that. Um, now, we did get um, a longer scene of Cooper with the man from another place. Um with their, they kind of interact more than they did in the final cut. Uh, the the uh, little man uh, introduces the ring to Cooper and poses the question, is it future, is it future? or is it, past? is it past? And we're just like, if you've watched the return, you're just like, whoa. You're like, what the, what? Yeah, you start channeling your best Keanu Reeves and go, whoa. Yeah, you're just sort of, you're just left going, oh. And this, I know. again, I think if this had been in the original, yeah. would have blown our minds when we saw the return. The return. I totally but now, agree. because the return, it's blowing our minds now that we're seeing it as the missing pieces. Because when I saw this as the missing pieces, I just yeah. thought, whatever, it's more man from another place and Cooper. We'll just watch it. Yeah. But now when I saw it again, I'd forgotten that. I'd forgotten about it. And I saw it again. I was like, what? Yep. So, yeah, that was something else. Which is why it's great, great to watch these after you watch The Return, because you pick up on so much more. And, it's and that's one of the neat things about Twin Peaks, that the further you go and then revisit, yeah. the better your revisiting is going to be, which is a different – that's a different model for a lot of narrative yeah, storytelling. Because, because obviously, you know, when th these missing pieces were first on the um, the entire mystery set, this was before the return. So we had, so we're just like, yeah. oh, whatever, whatever. Just, just more right. like, you know, little man from another place nonsense. But now we're just like, oh, it's this, it's like, oh, it's all timey wimey. Oh, it's all wibbly wobbly. It all goes together. It all makes sense now. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. And that's the thing. It does it just make sense. It, it, everything, it and doesn't then, necessarily make sense, but it comes together. It all yeah. connects to itself. And then David Tennant shows up and, you know, it's just, Everything goes. It's, it's just fantastic. It's all a thing. All right. Next scene. Bob speaks through I Laura. That would be Christopher Eccleston. But oh, I see what you did. Because I said fantastic. Fantastic. So. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. You know something? You were fantastic. And you know what? So was I. So was I. 
Yep. <laughs> yes, you were, Christopher Eggleston. I love you. Yeah, you should have come back for the fiftieth. You, you, you. Why? Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. One of these days, Eccleston, bang, zoom, right to the, days, right Eccleston. to Gallifrey. Yeah. Right to Gallifrey. All That's right. it. Back to Winnipeg. <laughs> there you go. So the next scene is Bob speaking through Laura and the blue sweater. Holy crap, was this skate scene terrifying when Laura is just standing there looking Look, at the fan and smiling. That scene, yes. And I totally, oh I totally agree. The first time I saw this, when I was going through the missing pieces on, on the entire mystery, I'm just like, oh my God, why was this not used? Because that, that, this, this is scene, definitely that had to be in there. Been there. That should have been there, and I think that that was. It's so damn creepy, and this smile, this 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 slow build into a creepy smile, as she's kind of like looking and looking like, at like, like she like she's got this grin that she it's being forced on her, like she's like right. she's resisting against it, but she can't help it. Right, right. Like Bob's making her do this. And it's just like this big force grin like on her it's face. It's like she's going down the street and she's trying not to smile. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and the yell yep. will last forever. <laughs> but I love this. Sort of reminded me of. So, um, you, so you've got a real indication that there's a laugh, laugh coming on. on. I got a real indication. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that, that's a Twin Peaks soundtrack. Not if you're yes, you're kind the of Firewalk weird. with, fire with Me soundtrack. Yeah. yeah. And that that her smile reminded me of the Black Hole Sun video, which to this day creeps me the heck out. I can't. That video is weird. If if you guys haven't seen the uh, um, Soundgarden, the uh, uh, what I just said it, the Black Hole Sun by Soundgarden. Yeah. It's yeah. they're digitally altered eyes and smiles, but yeah. they're very creepy. And this was not digitally altered, and it was no. Even, this is pure Cheryl uh, Lee, and it's just Cheryl like, Lee is wow. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought one of the things I thought was interesting about the sweater scene was the, you know, Laura, did you take my blue sweater again, Mom? You're wearing what it. What do you wear? <laughs> and then she looks down and she starts to cry and she says, "It's happening again." Now that is interesting. After you watch the return, after she you watch the return because you're like, "Oh, was that Judy?" If hmm. and remember, yeah, she. You know, spoiler alert for next episode. Yeah. That it is, in fact, Sarah Palmer as a girl in 1955. <gasps> I haven't so, read that far yet. Oh, curse you. Yes, you have. I haven't. I've only gotten halfway through the book. Sorry, spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> so we know that. Curse you. Things happen to her. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, fine. You tease me with the Blu ray that I don't have. Why don't you? I couldn't resist. Sorry. That's fine. That's fine. But yeah, spoiler alert, we do know that that is, in fact, Sarah Palmer. Which, as we as we theorized. Which we theorized, yes. And so so things have been going on with her for a while, where she just passes out and maybe doesn't know what she's doing, maybe doesn't remember things. Which, or, is, which kind of explains why she drinks and smokes so heavily. Well, definitely drinks. Yeah, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. So. But yeah, what what is happening again, and what happened to her before? That makes yeah. me very curious about Sarah Palmer. Right. So now yeah, we need that season four so bad. Yes, yes, we do. All right, well, All right. David Lynch and Mark Frost. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, next scene is Sunday at the Johnsons. So while everybody's at church on Sunday, Leo's showing Shelley the correct way of cleaning the floor. I'm gonna show you how to clean this floor, and then you're gonna do it. <sighs> You gotta get down and you know you gotta scrub you gotta scrub yeah exactly so don't even think clean. about going anywhere i'm not finished with you yeah so this is just an extended scene uh next scene is smash First up thing is to have a good attitude that's the key <laughs> anybody will tell you that you do that so uncomfortably well well, and I think this I think this would have benefit also from being longer in the actual movie because this was another one that sort of felt tacked on to me, like, oh, Madchen and Eric wanted to be in the movie, so here you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was um I mean it does it does advance the plot of Well, the it, it, just sh- it shows how Santa abusive Claus Leo and, is and whatnot. Right. And I'm looking for Santa Claus and all that stuff, but I think the longer version of it gave you a little bit it it felt less 
tacked on being longer, it felt a little more deliberate, I think. Right, it felt more natural, like it flowed better. Uh, next scene is Smash Up, where we have Norma and Ed sitting in a truck, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. I loved this scene so much. Because we never really get to see, like, Norma and Ed, we don't get to see them that much actually being together. Alone. Well, and I- I love the idea that they're still sort of star-crossed teenagers. They still have to sneak out in his car. Right. I think that's adorable. And then Ed ends up taking a breathalyzer because apparently he's too hammered to drive. And yeah, so, they, I, so they are like, okay, I guess we have to wait this out. Gee darn. And they turn, that means. Now they turn to the radio and they're listening to the fire walk with me theme. That's so beautiful. Yeah. While they're talking about the relationship. So. Yes. So I thought, yeah, any chance you get more of Big Ed and Norma, especially now that we I'm, know that now that they got actually got the payoff. They did. And they did. I've been loving Love. you. Too oh, and long. spoiler alert. Yeah. They did. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You're happy about that. So happy for Norma and Ed. Oh, my God. Those crazy kids. All right. Uh, next crazy scene is kids. The Power and the Glory, where we have Lauren, Lauren Donna riding in a speeding car, arriving with their hookups at the Power and the Glory bar near the border. And this is where Donna sees Laura snorting coke, I think, for the first time. I think so, yes. It look, from the look on her face, it looks like she's yeah, yeah, she freaks, trying, trying to have a poker face. Yeah, she kind of freaks out about it a little bit. And Laura's like, you're such a downer, Donna. A downer. Yep. And so they go inside, and there's like, um, it's a room that has Canada and U.S. of effing A. Yes. Above the bar. That is so funny. Yep. And so... Um, now, interestingly, this scene actually like makes it a little more clear that the pink room scene was not actually at the roadhouse because it was a oh, little. I got that I was, I always got that it wasn't. Yeah, see, I thought it was a little. Yeah, you know, like some people got it confused. I, mean, I kind of oh. thought it was somewhere else too because it just didn't look like the roadhouse. But this, it looks like it. Could, yeah, it could be like the champagne room of the roadhouse or something. <laughs> but it this definitely makes it more obvious that this is a completely different bar. It's the VIP room. No. It's the VIP room. <laughs> yeah. And if you know what, and if and if it's Jacques Renault deciding who's a VIP or who isn't, it's not a VIP room. No, no. Just, just FYI, it's a DOA room, mm-hmm. not, a VO, not a VIP room. Or you're going to be sweeping just all night. <laughs> but hey, it's to Booker T and the MGs, or what, no? That's fine. Yeah. yeah, it's Booker T and the MGs. Okay, okay. I thought. All right, I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, got it right. I was trying to remember that off the top of my head. I couldn't remember. Uh, Good job. All right. Pulled that one out of my butt. Uh, so next scene is Fire Walk With Me, where it's a cool scene. I kind of wish they would have kept this one in because it's it's pretty brief. Mike is sitting with a shirt off in his motel room. This is mm-hmm. Mike Michael Gerard, the one-armed man. Uh, or Philip Gerard, excuse me. Uh, Philip Gerard. And he's unlighting. Mike Lidecker. Yes, my, uh, Mike Lidecker. Thank you. Yes. yes. Shoe salesman. Slash the arm, slash the man yep. from another place, slash. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, but I, I've just always called him Philip Gerard. Yeah. So anyway, Mike is unlighting a circle of candles. No, he, it's Bob Lidecker, isn't it? Oh. Yes, Bob Lidecker. Bob Lidecker. So it's just about my best friend in the whole world. Right. Well, what's Mike's name? All right. Something for us to look up later. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to be continued on that one, but but yeah, he's basically he's they're doing like a reverse uh, video of him lighting these candles, so that now yeah. it looks like he's unlighting them, right? Which I thought, was kind of, which I thought yeah. it looks really cool reversed, and uh, and of course he's saying backwards, he's saying "fire walk with me," yes. But so that's kind of cool. So I just thought it was look it, visually, it looked cool. I think it was visually cool as well. Yeah. It looks really nice. And it just kind of reminds you that, hey, Mike's out there doing stuff. Yeah. All right. Mike's still there. Whatever, whatever purpose that was, we have no idea. Next scene is Party Girl. And this is after reading her about her in Flesh World, Leland, oh. Leland calls up Teresa Banks. Mm-hmm. He's like, hey, I saw you in Flesh World. Be all creepy. 
and he, and uh, she invites him to room one two three. Should be too hard to remember that. At, right. at the at the Red Diamond City Motel, but uh, Leland, of course, looks inside, sees Laura, so he takes off. As we it's know, see. right, and here we see. Now Jacques told us about this later that she called asking about their fathers, but right. we see her calling, asking about what Laura Palmer's father looks like and what Ronette's fathers look like. And this is probably what gets her killed is her. Yes. Cause she, trying cause she, to she yeah, blackmail you could, yeah, cause, yeah. She basically calls him up and the, and the suspicion that Laura's father is in fact the, her John. Right. And, uh, so yeah, and then of course it confirms it. So she yeah, she's like, like basically she's like, oh, um, I'm gonna try and blackmail you, and this does not. This basically kind of seals her death warrant. I think. I think so. I think this is exactly what got her killed because I think she would have just been kind of off the radar. Yeah, and this Leland of course gets this real ragey Bob face. Yeah. yeah so. But it's a, so this, I think, probably would have been nice to have that in there. I think so, too. Yeah. Oh, and, and of course, we kind of get to, to see what uh, happened after Leland took off. So right. we have Teresa going to Laura and Ronette, and they kind of have a threesome. Yeah, like a little threesome because they yep. still got the money, right. even though they didn't do anything. Yeah, we got paid. So at least, yeah, at least Leland wasn't a dick. <laughs> he so, didn't stiff him. Yeah. Yeah, he still, he still, still got paid, the money. He still paid him. Um, yeah. But uh, and then we get another shot of the ring, the ring, because mm-hmm, she kind of brushes her hair and it's like, hey, That's look, the there's comes. the ring that everybody's all worried about. Yeah. 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 Um. Next scene is don't forget slash Laura's secret stash, not Jay and Bob's secret stash. Um, yeah, Laura's stash. Yeah. So Leland reminds Laura that hey, it's Johnny Horn's birthday, and. We see Laura and Sarah sitting at a table silently. Actually, you know, I take it back. I think this is the asparagus. Okay. Still, but there's a scene where she's eating asparagus at dinner, and right. I think that was cute. And then Laura snorts the last of her stash. Right. There's a little bit more of a production of her doing that this time yeah. around, which I thought was interesting. Right. So, yeah, it's just more like an extended cut, I think. Right. Uh, next scene is Bernie the Mule, where we have, we finally get to see, like, Harry and Andy and Hawk. In Firewalk with yeah, them, which, which would have yeah, been nice. Yeah, you see them. So they're basically, all they're doing, though, they're trying to set up a trap for Bernard Renault. Oh, Bernard is such an idiot. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Andy talks, says that uh, Bernie's coming in on foot. Harry confirms this. And then Harry asks if they will, I guess, uh, this means, or Andy asks, or wait, okay, hold on. Harry asks if he, Andy means that they're going to have a lot of past to cover. And Andy says, well, like, we're just going to have a lot of walking to do. Right. And I think this is, this is just another illustration of Andy sort of not getting it. He's got a bad cop, but he just sort of only t- takes the obvious. Yeah. yeah. And this is an interesting scene too. And I, this, I would have liked to have been in included because of Lucy doesn't understand the intercom either. Oh yeah, that's what happens in this too. Yes, hey, Lucy, they're talking. So, she's talking so now to after her, the return, because of, Chris, are you there? And then he yeah. shows up. Ah! Yeah. So and then Lu- and then Andy hears her, and he comes running out, and she comes running, and then they see each other, and then they both sort of get startled each other. So not only does she not understand cellular phones, she doesn't understand the intercom system. Yeah. So that was, so so that's kind of funny. You know, like yeah, because you know, and obviously you know it was kind of cool that Lynch brought that back for the return. Right, and I think it was a good thing that he brought it back because it makes Lucy's killing Doppelganger Cooper so much more of a victory for Lucy. Right. Because she's had this problem forever. <laughs> you know? Yeah, this isn't anything <laughs> she's new, definitely apparently. She's able to quite understand this concept. Yeah. So. All right, next scene is I Killed Someone. So this is after the day that the drug deal went south. Bobby we get a little bit of this in the original movie where it's just Laura and Bobby on the couch making out. Yeah. And 
But this time you see... Yeah, they're at basically at her right locker. Here. And I guess Bobby's telling her to hide the $10,000 in her safety deposit box. Oh, right. This is the locker. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm skipping. But I'm thinking this is her in his basement. No, no, no. That's, that's coming up, though. Um, so, yeah. So, and this is Laura, again, mocking uh, Bobby. Right. You killed a guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he's just like, shut up. He's like, yeah, I did for you to do coke. You better fucking shut your mouth. Right. So no, no, yeah. grat- no gratitude, zero gratitude. No gratitude whatsoever. No respect. Yeah. Uh, next scene is the baby oh, yeah. lax, baby no laxative. So oh yes, the baby. So like, Kill the is, guy for baby laxative. So this is basically Bobby losing his shit over like inspecting the cocaine bag while he's out in the woods and realizing it's baby laxative, which is pretty funny. Yeah, and he the, he dumps it all out, but then he gets it all over his legs. It's all over the place. Right, that, that was is, pretty funny. Yeah, just that like, was pretty good. Like, you're really not thinking this out, bro. Uh, next scene is send me. Know whatever happened with that guy? Like, you know, did did he ever show up as missing? I mean, what what the heck happened with that dude? Yeah, nobody noticed. Somehow, he Bobby was able to sweep that under the rug. Well, I think it was sort of probably he was probably Canadian. Yeah. So it's probably something that the Canadian police are looking into and not necessarily thinking, well, why would he go to the small town or yeah. I don't know. Maybe they figured or maybe they figured somebody else killed him. Who knows? Bobby got away with it. They're probably yeah, they're probably looking for Leo. Yeah. Or, or the one of the Renaults or something. Or one of the Renaults. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, you know, hey, there's like 5000 Renaults. One of them probably killed this guy. One of them, yeah. <laughs> probably, probably Bernard's going to take the fall yeah. for this one. That'd be fine. He's an idiot. It was like Ezekiel Renault. Or whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, Zebediah Renault. <laughs> so, uh, so this is next one's. Uh, send me a kiss, and this is kind of creepy. I think. This is the creepiest, and especially watching this after the the current month we've been having when it comes to yes, yes. You know, now, like, that, now that you put that in that context, uh, yes. Matt Lauer and Charlie Rose and, and fill, Garrison Keillor fill in the blank. Yeah. Yeah. Still, and who have, take your pick. So yeah. just sort of seeing this as you know, Doctor Jacoby is calling Laura at home, and I mean, we knew, we knew we knew we knew Jacoby was kind of creeping on his patient, Laura. But here, yeah, but it's just uncomfortable because not only is he creeping on her, he's like really bad at it. Yeah. Well, you know, he makes this point of like, you know, like um, he's kind of like going. You know, look, you should be call- you, you haven't been calling me. Yeah, he's like some like weird, creepy secret boyfriend or something. It's like, yeah. dude, and then Laura is, and Laura knows that she's got him wrapped around her finger. Oh, Laura knows so that she, about him. So she has like zero respect for the guy. Right. And uh, she says, well, OK, maybe I'll make some tapes for you. Mm-hmm. Which, which, of well, course, we find out she that does that make some tapes. Yep. And uh, in the, in the mo- ultimate creepy moment, Jacoby says, tells her to send him a kiss. Gross. You. Oh, you. Stop it, and uh, she goes to snort the last line of cocaine, but then she gives it up. She doesn't snort it. Right. Right. So either she, f- well, maybe I'll save that for later or who knows. Yeah, I think it's a save it for later thing. Uh, but yeah, Jacoby. Jeez. Uh, and this next scene is the asparagus. Is that so, the next scene? Okay, this, that's the I next keep... scene. So yeah, so we have Laura eating dinner with her mother. Uh, so she's like, I don't want to eat the asparagus. And we, so we got that nod to the diary. Yep. And Sarah tells her that Leland's staying late with Ben to work on the plan for the Norwegians. Mm-hmm. Laura tells her that she's going to Bobby's to do homework. Sarah tells her it's a school night, but, you know, be back by by nine, nine, right? And after Laura leaves the room to put away her dishes, Sarah lights right up. Gets a cigarette. I I kept expecting her to take her face off, you know, just. (sighs) Yeah, now that we've watched The Return, you're just like, yeah. Do you really want to, do you really want to F with this? this? Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. exactly. How much is. What is going on with Sarah Palmer? I feel like that could be a completely different series. <sighs> yeah, it, it seems Palmer like Palmer Frost. Like it, this could be like just a parallel ser- series to what was going on in Twin Peaks. And, right. Yeah. Right. 
Exactly. So, you know, is it like maybe okay if Grace Zabriskie couldn't do it, somebody needs to like you know recast the role. Somebody do this because it needs. To be I done. I would not want to see it if it wasn't Grace Zabriskie. Really? I'll be honest. Okay. I wouldn't want to see it. You don't think anybody else could do it justice? And I kind of agree with you, by the way. I don't think anybody else could have done it justice because she's such a good actress and she has such intense eyes. Right. That I wouldn't I wouldn't want to see somebody else. I mean, I hate to say it, but as jarring as it is to see somebody else playing Donna Hayward, that's okay. She's not a very intense character. No. But Sarah Palmer is, and I think she benefits from Grace Zabriskie. And it's a credit to Grace Zabriskie that she's that she is that kind of irreplaceable. I totally agree. Oh yeah. All right. Uh, next scene is Bobby and Laura in the basement. Right. So this is that I was getting confused. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we had Major Briggs reading to his wife Betty from the Book of Revelation because, as you do in Twin Peaks, apparently. As you do. Yeah. So just kind of showing that kind of disconnect between the parents and their kids. Definitely. And especially, especially in this situation. Well, I think it's, I think it's tenfold for the Briggs family because Major Briggs is so strict and militar- militaristic. Right. But right. he also knows what's going on. But he has no idea that it's going on with Laura, that Laura and Bobby are experiencing some of this. He has no idea that what's going on Right. He's, 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 right. he's so kind of wrapped up in his own, I don't, want to, I don't want to say drama, but just more like his own thing. His own thing. Yeah, exactly. His own world, I should say. And, well, and it's almost like he leaves work at work and comes home and home is home. Yeah. And yeah. never the twain shall meet. And I think that's preventing him from seeing what's right in front of him. Right. He's, maybe he's just so old school and traditional. Or at least tries to be. Right. And uh, as a result, yeah, there's just this big disconnect between him and Bobby. Uh, exactly. So uh, Bobby reveals to Laura that the uh, co- cocaine they supposedly picked up was ba- baby laxative. Baby laxative. Yep. And Laura is kind of freaking at this moment. She's like, what? <laughs> Say, I need s- cocaine. Like, douchebag says what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I need cocaine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cocaine. <laughs> I hear it's somebody's birthday. I'm Dr. Roxo. Nice. And then and then Pam Poovy shows up. <laughs> cocaine. And eats all of the cocaine. Yay! Okay. Cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so they and it's a little bit of a more extended scene of the, them talking way, about it's not wait, the, uh, Archer shirt. Or the Cooper yes, shirt. I see you're wearing your Archer Cooper shirt. That's yeah, nice. Yeah. Couldn't resist. But this Couldn't is an resist. extended scene of where Bobby is realizing that Laura doesn't love him. She loves the drugs. Right. And he uh, doesn't even care. He's no, he just loves her so he much. Just, yeah, exactly. He's just like, I know she doesn't love me. I know it's all about the drugs for her, but I need her so much because I'm in love with her. That right, I'm he's like w- willing to put up with it. So there's like no self-respect here at all. I don't know if it's that or if it's that everybody loves Laura. That Laura just has that effect on people. Even Doc Hayward. Right. Why is it I don't allow smoking in my house, but I right. let you smoke here? Yeah, that's, a good, that's she a good point. A, she has a spell on people. It doesn't, and and I think Bobby. I don't think it's a lack of self-respect. I think it's a he just is so enchanted by Laura that there's, it doesn't matter as long as he gets to be around her and be with her. He's happy. Okay. So he's just, he's just so under her spell. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Think so. All right. Uh, so I guess after he and Laura officially break up, the Laura leaves her ho- his house and he lights up a cigarette, of course, even though his father told him to put it out. Mm hmm. And then uh, Bobby goes off, still smoking the cigarette, and Major Briggs goes back to reading the Bible because he's such a party. He is a party, yeah. <laughs> yeah. His parents, that boy, can you imagine their dating life must have been crazy? Yeah. Can't imagine why Bobby's the way he is. Right. All right. Uh, next scene is Good Night, Lucy. Oh, yes. Good Night, Lucy. Yeah. 
and uh, yeah, not good night, Margaret. Thankfully, but but no, uh, so so Lucy calls Harry and Andy in the interrogation room, and this is where she kind of has her intercom trouble. Right, right. And she tells Harry that Josie Packard saw a Prowler, and he's like, "Well, gotta go check this out." And yep. like, he might as well start combing his hair or something. Yeah, like exactly. Like, well, I gotta, you know. He's like, bow, chick, bow, wow. Yeah. And he, said, and he, might as, and he, he might as well have said, like, I think it's best I take this case alone, fellas. You might as well go home. Let me splash so. on some cologne to go uh, to go check exactly. out this, pr- this prowler. <laughs> Let me go check out this prowler. Do I look okay? Yeah. That's my hair. <laughs> Anything between my teeth? Okay, just checking. Yeah. He's totally, he's totally trying to play it off like, oh, well, just gotta do my job as the cop. But yep. no, we know why he's going over there. Gotta go serve and protect. Yeah. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> see what I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, um, so this is where Lucy gets freaked out when Harry appears at the front desk because she hasn't figured right. out intercom. She get it. She doesn't get intercom either. Yep. So it's pretty funny. It's, that was pretty funny, especially after we watched the return because it's like, oh, it's more of the same. Uh, <laughs> and then Lucy realizes that Andy is no longer in the meeting room and runs to check on him. And then they collide and Lucy freaks out. Totally, totally cute moment between them. Yeah. So it's just, just like the cell phone reaction pretty much. Uh, next scene is waiting for James. So while sneaking out on the night of her death, Laura waits outside for James and she watches Leland slash Bob come home. Right. And, and so she waits for him to go inside. She's like, go inside. Yeah. This is a very tense moment, obviously. Right. And then we, we know that even though he goes inside, he still sees her leave. Yeah. Because James. And there's this moment where he's like looking right at her and you're like, well, does he see her or is he just looking in that direction? Know. And she's kind yeah. of wondering, and- that, wondering that too. Well, and you just want to say, James, could you, like, tighten up the throttle a little bit on that? Could you be more obvious just <laughs> roaring down the street on your bike? <laughs> Seriously. There's, like, you know, eight guys in this town that ride a motorcycle. One of them is in high school and is possibly dating Leland Palmer's daughter. Could you maybe be a little less conspicuous? Yeah, he's like one of the motorcycle guys on South Park. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's. I always thought, like, James, shut up. Oh, my God. <laughs> maybe you walk, maybe you stop at the end and walk your bike to the, yeah. you know, sort of, you know, like when you walk on a motorcycle, you're, like, straddling it and walking with your tippy toes. Maybe do that, pick up Laura, and yeah. then start it back up again. Exactly, exactly. Or just, like, hey, park your bike, walk a little bit, come get Laura, you guys go back to the bike and take off. Or, and when she gets on it, don't rev the stupid thing. Yeah. Just go <laughs> Well, he's trying to be badass. I mean, as badass as James gets. As as badass as James can possibly be. But he's just yeah. he's just making problems. He's just borrowing trouble. Yeah. Well, yeah, because as biker biker guys go, James is probably the least threatening biker guy ever. Probably, yeah. You know, unless you're, uh, yeah. I don't know. You know, because, yeah, there's not a lot of, you know, if there are a lot of biker guys that hang around, like, you know, coffee house libraries, I'm yes. unaware of it. Yeah. But, I mean, again, I'm not into biker culture, so I wouldn't know. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, next scene is um, Distant Screams, where we have the log lady listening to Laura and Ronette's screams from the cabin. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we not, be, her- not being able to do a damn thing about it. We hear her tell of this. In the original series, the but owls were is, silent. This is us actually seeing it, and this is again another thing that I think should have been included yeah. in the final version of the film. If nothing else gets the log lady in the movie, heck yeah, it does. Yeah, which is always a good thing. Always a good thing. All right. Uh, next time, ta- next scene is Lonesome Foghorn Blows, where we have Laura's body body floating up on the shore right outside the Packards, and. This is just a few hours before Pete finds her, but uh, apparently this is like uh, it's a sim- just kind of like an alternate shot, I think. Right. Okay. So I think uh, it's I think it's just it's the same. It's more of the same. Yeah. So no big deal there. Uh, next scene is the epilogue, where lots of stuff goes down in this one. Oh, 
So we get a shot of uh, Glastonbury Grove with the uh, title card or the subtitles uh, some months later, picking up after the end of the final yes. episode from the original series where we get Annie rushed to the hospital. So she finally gets and taken have, care of. Go ahead. Right. And we have it says the same thing to the nurse that she says to Laura in Laura's dream. Yes. So, she, yeah, she kind of repeats that that whole scene. So it's almost like from Annie's point of view. Right. Because, because I think right. that Annie was projecting backwards through time at that moment. Right. I think so, too, that it's that it is a wibbly wobbly wobbly thing where right. as she says it to the nurse, she's saying it to Laura because, like two years prior. Because she's kind of like acting like she's just kind of like almost catatonic as she says it. Right, she's just staring off into Star- the, into the space, into yeah. the ceiling. and yeah. I think this is definitely, definitely a scene that I think should have been included, right? Because I said for years I felt that scene was tacked on, yep. and yep. if I had seen this, I would have thought, oh my gosh, I would have thought the exact same thing. I would have thought she's projecting back into time to talk to Laura, and there's more to this, and it's more deliberate, and there, it makes more sense, and it would have felt less. Um, Oh, Heather Graham wants to be in the movie. Quick, write something down. <laughs> so, and of course, we know now after the return that there was a lot more to this scene, or there was a lot more to Laura talk, Annie talking to Laura than we originally thought. Right. But it took us twenty five years to get there. Yeah, this this scene would be great if you did like an extended cut of the final episode from the original series. Yes, that would have been great. You know, like the whole in the whole scene with Cooper that we get we'll get into in a moment where he's like after he's been possessed by Bob and realizes it and smashes the mirror. Flipped on the sink, will you help me get find out find out what happened after he smashed the mirror? I think this would be great for that. That would have been great. It'd be like a special somebody should do that as like a like a just a Come on, Internet. Yeah, YouTube YouTube, give me give me that extended cut, Internet. Yep. Um, because I don't have time for it. Uh if you notice, there's a little tidbit that Caroline or Annie is wearing Caroline's dress when she checks into the hospital. Right. But remember, when she was taken to the lodge, she was wearing that black velvety that black gown. Gold dress. Yeah. Yeah, from the from the um, Miss Twin Peaks competition. Ooh wee! What's up with that? Yep. What's up? With that? <laughs> yeah. Nice Saturday Night Live reference. Wearing Caroline's dresses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, there's a. Scene where Cooper is talking to the man from another place again, where um, Cooper's asking where the ring is now, and the the man from another place, the arm, says someone else has it now. Mm-hmm. And Cooper's like Annie, Annie. He's like, oh crap. He's like, oh no, I yeah. I, holy, I didn't quite think this through. Holy crap, and. So he's like, okay, where am I and how can I leave? And the arms just kind of chuckling to himself. I was like, you are here. Now there is no place to go but home. <laughs> and he starts laughing. That's the thing. So where is home? Is home that outer yeah. space? Welcome to the Hotel California. You can check out anytime you like, but you can never, never leave. leave. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, so we then we have the nurse uh, who's tending to Annie. Uh, she steals that ring and then admires it in the mirror. Big mistake. That yeah. Yep. Now I'm kind of bummed that we didn't get to see the nurse in the return. I'm wondering who she did. She turn out to be somebody that I don't know. Maybe was maybe was one of the followers of the zone blog oh or something okay. like that I'm oh, that's, a, that's, she, a, that's a good theory i like yeah that. all right there's more season four material right there come on mark frost david lynch Let's What's, do it. yeah exactly um and then we talked about the where the that extended part, well that part after what happens when cooper hits his head in the mirror right um and then cooper tells harry it struck me as funny do you hear me harry it struck it me struck as me funny. funny yeah which right and there should have been a nice tip off that, okay, Cooper's not right. Let's get him checked out. 
But again, we have the same thing with Cooper that we had with Dougie. Right. You and I are watching Dougie and saying, why is everyone <laughs> acting like this is perfectly normal? Right. But then we eventually find out that Dougie was in a bad car accident. So I think people are more understanding of his being quirky because he's still healing. Right. And I think that's the same thing that's going on with Cooper. Here. So they're just kind of Not writing only- it off because he was in a like this weird experience. Not only did he go into the woods, disappear, and then all of a sudden just show up, yeah. he just slipped hit his head on the mirror. So not only did he have this weird supernatural thing happen to him, but he also had this head injury. So yeah. I think what we what they should have been seeing as warning signs were seen as, okay, we need to be treating a head a head trauma in a different way. Right. And I think that in that scene with the It Struck Me as Funny, I think that Kyle McLaughlin did a fantastic job of taking a cue from Ray Wise as to how you act when you are possessed by Bob and Bob is trying to make you act normal. Okay. I think he took what Ray Wise did in his performance and ran with it. And, yeah. you know, because the, it struck me as funny. It's very yeah. much like, that kind of, I'm, I'm yeah, that kind of nonsense of saying normal words. Right. And they just, that kind of like, you know, like that, I'm not me type of performance. Right. I'm, exactly. some, I'm someone else inside me. Yeah. That, 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 and, pose- and that, Leland, that possessed. Right. Again, with Leland, you have someone who everybody that we're seeing now. Right. Knows Leland since he was possessed by Bob. So Leland's just kind of a quirky guy yeah. to them. He's because an odd, they've he's, never known. He's a weird oddball, but yeah. He's been possessed by just, just roll it. Just roll with it. Yes, just roll with it. Yeah, he's fine. He's harmless. Yeah. Now, uh, to, so- to Harry's credit, though, he does try to say suggest that they should go to a hospital because of his head injury. Right. Right. Um, and Doppelganger Cooper, now that we know it's Doppelganger Cooper uh, and Bob inside him, it's kind of crowded in there. Uh, he says, but I haven't brushed my teeth yet. Yeah. Which apparently is the new ending to the original series, if you think about continuity wise. Yeah. Exactly. That's where it ends. So it's just kind of like muhaha to be continued. Mm-hmm. And obviously right. it is continued in the return, but Because that's what he does when in the original series, when he gets out of bed, he says, I have to brush my teeth. I have to, br- br- I have to brush my teeth. And that's why he goes in the bathroom yeah, in the first yeah, place. Yeah. And then he squeezes that toothpaste tube out. And, and breaks he, our collective hearts. Yeah, we're like... Oh. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, 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 no. Ah, oh, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. no. Just like he, and then you're like, I can't not look at it. Oh, no. my God. Yeah, this is... It becomes the ultimate... Can you imagine if they had YouTube reaction videos back then? Oh, my God. <laughs> that would be the ultimate I YouTube reaction video. I that crazy girl. Yeah. Oh, that would be hilarious. All right, so that's it. That's all the uh, uh, missing pieces. That's all the missing pieces. That's all the missing pieces. The only thing we really have left is the interviews that uh, with Cheryl Lee and Ad- Angela Battlementi. And then the Between Two Worlds, which is just stuff that was on the, um, in the, in the entire mystery set. Right, again, we have a little bit of a repackaging thing going on here, but I think yeah. it's nice that it's... yeah. Oh, with its with its so it's on its own thing. Yeah. So. So the other thing I re- I noticed I noted about the uh, Shirley interviews I noted that okay, she's fifty years old and she's like really complimentary to Ray, Grace and Angelo, and she obviously trusts David Lynch implicitly. She absolutely does, and I loved her talking about she was hired to play Laura Palmer's corpse. That's what she started out doing. And then when they decided to go further with the series and flesh out the character, David Lynch calls her and says, do you want to come back and be in the show? And she says, I can't, I'm dead. Yeah. Which I thought was, you you just, someone with that kind of dark humor wit is perfect to work with David Lynch, I think. Yeah, totally agree. Um, And then she talks about how difficult the, the pink room scene was, which understandably Understandably, yes. And how hard it was to let Laura go, because apparently they kind of became. She, I think, maybe Shirley was like talking about method acting here, because that the two became so intertwined. 
Well, and I, it, surely we know it was hard to let all of us didn't want to let go of Laura. Right. So we can right. only imagine what it must have been like for you. Yeah. And she talks about like, well, all those warning signs surrounding Laura, like that people should have picked up on. Yeah, exactly. And this I thought was kind of helpful is that where she talks about like all the women that have come up to her and shared their incest stories. That is so wonderfully generous of Cheryl Lee to be available to listen to those things because that's, it's so it's so personal. It's so personal, and it's. I think having a story like Laura's to see, you can, yeah. Yeah. if you have an experience like that, you can say, "I can get out of this." Right. It's. Po- I mean, and I, not in the way that Laura does, but no, I would hope there not. are pitfalls. Right, there are pitfalls that Laura goes through. That. I think. It, I think. It, I think it's kind of like 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 a a warning, like you know, like hey. Uh, don't go down this road. If this is happening to cautionary. you, yeah, the, exactly the cautionary here. That's a perfect way right. to phrase it, I think. Um, the, you know, just like, hey, look, don't be like Laura. Right. You know, you know, you know, go out there and seek good, proper help. Exactly. Exactly. Go to a go to a doctor who isn't going to get dis- discredited yeah. <laughs> in like three years after you start seeing him. It doesn't ask you to like. Send you, send, ta- you send you tapes oh. with a, with send you a kiss in the tapes. Ugh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, Dr. Jacoby. Yeah, you can do better than Doctor Jacoby is your therapist. He needs to shovel his own shit. That's what I'm. That's pretty much. Jeez, Louise. Pretty much. So, anyway, so that's the stuff I found was interesting about that. Yeah. And then Angela Battalamenti's interview I thought was kind of interesting because he's talking about like Paul McCartney wanting Twin Peaks music at the Quinn. Queen's birthday celebration at Buckingham Palace. That's which is just so rock star to like. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, Paul McCartney wanted my these Twin Peaks music for the celebration. <laughs> and I'm just like, you you just name name check Paul McCartney like well, and, you, <laughs> and and the Queen celebration in one shot. <laughs> um, there was a, a CD put out a few years back called Bedtime with the Beatles. Yeah, it's similar to those Rockabye Baby. Um, instrumental lullaby versions of popular music and bands. But the guys who put it together said that they met Paul McCartney and he told them that he really liked that project. And he just sort of sat in his house with a glass of wine and listened to that. And they're sort of like, uh, Paul McCartney knows who we are. Right. Exactly. (laughs) And that's, that's the thing I can imagine. I mean, there are some people who are just, and I said this about William Shatner when I met him, at a convention, you know, for the 10 seconds I was there with him, that he's so famous, he's like meeting a statue, that it's almost not even like there's a person there. There's this persona that is so famous. And, you know, Paul McCartney is one of those one of those people. And um, anybody from the Beatles, actually, uh, the band The Posies have a song that I really like called Golden Blunders. Right. Essentially about marrying too young, your golden blunders are your wedding rings. And Ringo Starr covered that song. Like he called them up like, Hey, I want to put this song on my record. And they're like, uh, you're Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> it's just completely, they're right. like, you can do whatever the hell you want. You are right. Ringo star. Right. You get a pass. And, yeah. Right. Exactly. Or there's the, um, I, I don't remember if it was a Kennedy center honors or what it was, but, um, mm. the people being honored were John Paul Jones and Robert Plant and Jimmy Page. And it was Led Zeppelin. And there's a performance during the, during the ceremony and it's heart doing stairway to heaven. Oh, wow. And Ann Wilson is forever my hero because she could still belt out stairway to heaven as good as Ann Wilson can do in front of Robert Plant, Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones. I could. I don't even think that I could be alive in front of Robert Plant. That takes Some serious people. lady parts to do that. Oh my god! I mean, that is. I would just be. I, I like I am right now, but just ten times. I don't even know what I would say. That, that's amazing. So, but yeah, to, but, but to be like, yeah, Paul McCartney wanted my yeah. Paul McCartney knows who I am. I mean, that's 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 amazing. Yeah. So, I can just picture Paul like. 
Now, Angelo, tell me, what is it about the Red Room that makes, you know, like, you're just asking him, tw- I like uh, being a Twin Peaks fanboy, I just think it would be hilarious. Angelo! <laughs> Angelo! Small tree! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, and that's, that's the thing about good musicians, is that they are interested in all different kinds of sounds and music. And, you know, I'll give that to Paul McCartney for being open to right. something different. Well, you, you, yeah, that's, that's, you, you want Paul McCartney to be that kind of open to experimentation. Right. As right, far exactly. as, you know, musical, right. musical, like draw from all these different musical influences. Right. That's why Neil Young is so amazing. Yeah. Because he's never going to be one to talk about, you know, the crap that the young people are doing. He's like, all right, well, show me what you got, kids. Yeah. So. Yeah. So anyway, so I thought that was kind of cool to be like, look, that's okay. That's a pretty good anecdote. Yes. Um, and then he talks about. Um, uh, the queen, yeah, the queen was apparently like she had to go because it was time for her to watch Twin Peaks. So that the, is so, awesome. So the queen, Queen Elizabeth II, is a Peaks freak, apparently. That is, I love, I love and, and, it. And just like, wait, what, what? <laughs> there, you know, there's, there's, there's told, more to her than the eye. I think I told Lori about this, and Lori's like a big Anglophile, at least as far She's as big Anglophile, isn't she? She's like yeah, all into the royal family so, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, great. so it's. You know, like she basically she's piecing together all this English history with like the Tudors and, you know, the the TV show, the Tudors. And, oh, yeah. And the White Queen and the White Princess. And and uh, and uh, you know, she's watching Outlander and all this. And so it's just uh, so she was I told her this and she's just like, really? I go, apparently so. So. Maybe uh, maybe this will be the little uh, push that Lori needs to finally watch Twin Peaks. Well, no, no, no. She's watched Twin Peaks with me, but she's just never been into it. But she's it's been like a grudging. Experience. Yeah, she, it, it's one of those like she put it tolerated me. She like, re- she she did it for it me for you, not because yes. she's having fun. No, yeah. no, 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 exactly. exactly. Um, so and then he also talks about this song uh, for Isabella Rossellini in Blue Velvet. Oh yes, and. That Lynch thought it was quote peachy keen. That's the ticket. That's oh my gosh, that That's, is so Gordon Cole. Yeah, pretty much. Those those lines have to blur. So <laughs> I mean, yeah. they're you know, it's just they're one. You know, they're one character really. It's exactly. Like this whole person. Yeah, Gordon Cole is David Lynch with a hearing problem. Yeah. So and then he, he was talking about you know creating the Twin Peaks theme and Laura's theme, and you're just like, really? Oh. Uh, so. Tell me more stories, Angelo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I thought that was kind of cool. I was geeking out yeah. on that. Oh, yeah. Um, anything else about this release you want to talk about that I've missed? I don't think there is much else. Okay. I thought I kind of ran it down. So uh, I have two ratings here, one for the film and one for the Criterion release. Okay. So the film, I'm gonna was what I gave before was 8 out of 10 Blue Roses. Nice. And the Criterion release, I'm going to give it seven spoonfuls of cream corn. Oh, that's a good. Uh, that's a good one. What should What should I give it? That's a really good question. I'll give it seven bags of baby laxative. Okay, very nice. So we're pretty in sync okay. on that one, then. We are pretty in sync on that one. It, I I feel like it. But the thing is, this is me from a standpoint of being only mildly sated from having more Twin Peaks recently. Yes. So I think if you had given me this two years ago, I'd have been like, oh my God, this is great. We got more stuff. Yeah. But now I'm just like, give me more. I want more. There's got to be more out there. And maybe <laughs> it isn't. That's the thing. Maybe this is all that there is. Let's hope not. Yeah. Well, I no, I just mean from back then. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Footage yeah. that we have. Right, right, right. So. You, you figured this would have been it. Like, this is the right. last of the, like, scraping the bottom of the barrel to get more Twin Peaks stuff. Right, exactly. And now we've got to make, now we just have to make our own, make yeah. more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So make more Mark Ross, David Lynch. Yep. So now we have another 25 years to come up with uh, all the other stuff that's come out since then. Don't make me wait that long, please. Uh, but yeah, I totally agree. All right, so. I'll next... do it. I mean, I'll wait, but I, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next time on Ghostwood. I guess what we're going to talk about the final dossier, Twin Peaks. We're the going final to talk dossier. about the final dossier. Yeah, yep. cause we're trying to play catch up here because obviously the the bo- dossier has been out for a while now. And yes, uh, yeah, so I took the dossier on the plane with me right, to Australia. Right. So we're so. still playing catch up, uh, and then of course we've got the season three release to go through with all the yep. special features. But we, we might. But we might. The final dossier came out first. So let's do that. 
I think so. This is uh, also by Mark Frost, who obviously wrote The Secret History of Twin Peaks. Yep. And like I said, I'm only halfway through it, but lots of stuff oh. to talk about. I'm sorry I spoiled that for that's you. Okay. That's you okay. That's okay. That's okay. I kind of, well, I mean, we, we speculated about it before, so it's not that yes, much of a did. spoiler. So we did. It's just more confirmation. Like, hey, we were right. Yay. We were right. Yay. Yay. Yes. So, I feel uh, smart now. Yeah. Me am smart. <laughs> Me fail that's English? Unlucky. That's I'm impossible. <laughs> Me fail English? That's impossible. That's one of my. That's my favorite all-time um, Ralph quote. I don't know if it's that or in the doctor said I didn't have worms anymore. It was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> and then there's also the doctor said if I didn't put, I wouldn't have so many nosebleeds if I just kept my finger at it. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph's one of my favorite characters of the Let's show. Let's not forget, is this my house? No, Ralph, you live in a different house. Oh, okay. Choo, 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 choo. You choo, choo, choose me? Oh, it's, there's a picture of a train. Yep. <laughs> Poor Ralph. Look at this, Lisa. You can actually pinpoint the moment his heart rips in half. <laughs> and now. <laughs> yep, sliding down that Simpsons rabbit hole once again. All right. Look at the tongue. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I was cracking myself. I think it's time to go. <laughs> I know, I know. It is. All right. So um, if you want to get a hold of us, we oh, actually, we do have some quick feedback. Do we have time, do we have time to go through it or do you want to save it I'll for next time? Oh, we have time for listeners. All right, all right. I will pull this up. So uh, where is it here? Oh, the e- checking the email. Checking the email. Checking. Checking the email. 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 Okay. The email. The email. So we got some <laughs> feedback. Start, maybe we should start a strong bad podcast where we just quote strong bad for like five minutes and then we're done. <laughs> we should just do the podcast as strong bad. A strong bad. Strong bad podcast. You can strong bad. And I and Ghostwood, I be, the Twin Peaks podcast by Strong Bad. And I could be Senior Cart Gage. <laughs> I can help you get a leg up on the pile. And I could be Bob. I don't see nobody taking me to Chick fil A. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh so this is uh this is from Chris I. Now he says uh, like the letter I. Uh, okay. Who is, is medicine- it Chris I? I don't know, maybe it is. Uh his his email is medicine dog seventy seven at yahoo dot com if you want to uh oh, no. so if you want to drop Chris Isaac a line apparently. <laughs> but um just saying. But uh so Chris writes in he said he's talking basically he writes this kind of very lengthy um manifesto <laughs> about okay um talking about the season and stuff and he says i think this season because this was this is actually emailed to the southgate media group email account that rob southgate our editor was kind of enough to forward to me uh oh, so he says so chris says i think the season is a pure work of art where there are more so many possibilities and explanations after reading the new Mark Frost book and going back to the series, I might have a new theory. I think Twin Peaks is doing a lot of ancient aliens on Twin Peaks, mixing religion and alien encounters and combining them into one world. I so think here's my yeah, go here's ahead. my superfluous impression. You like it? Yes. <laughs> Very nice. I think the fireman might be an exiled alien, Lucifer question mark. And creates Laura from his being possible fireman doppelganger to get back into the White Lodge. We never, uh, see, we never see the White Lodge, or do we? I th- kind of thought. I thought we did see the White Lodge. Uh, we we, o- we only see the Red Room, which is a waiting room to test oneself before advancing to the Black Lodge or the White Lodge. Uh, Laura was created to be a, like the Purgatory of Twin Peaks. That's that's what his. That seems what it sounds like he's hitting. Okay. At. Um, I always thought it was just like, hey, okay, this is the waiting room for the Black Lodge. Well, it could be there could be more to it. You yeah, never maybe, know. Yeah, it's true. There could be purgatory. Uh, Lori was created to be a martyr, so to infiltrate the White Lodge by the firemen. Laura was incubated in Sarah Palmer to be born with a soul in order to gain access to heaven, in parentheses, the White Lodge. Everything is fine in yeah. heaven. Yep. yep. Uh, when Sarah's watching the tiger mutilating the water buffalo and the boxing match in a loop, Judy is feeding off Sarah's pain and misery 
sucking her dry until she is no longer useful. Well, I kind of like that theory. I like that theory too. I, 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 I like where he's going with the other theory. I yeah. just don't like the idea of the fireman being a bad guy. Yeah, I don't either. Um, I mean, it could be, but I hope I'd like I to think. I like to think this is a pure good versus evil thing here. And I, I like to think that the fireman is good. Yeah, I, I really hope he is. And the last scene with Sarah is when Sarah's doppelganger kills her when Laura is taken from the timeline. I really considered Sarah's doppelganger. I thought it was more Judy. But interesting, interesting idea. It's, a, it's an intriguing idea. So uh, he said the woodsman is asking God a light because they were searching for Laura, the light slash essence that came from the fireman. Oh, I like that. Uh, the black and white pieces are all different areas of the Black Lodge, an alien spaceship slash dimension question mark. Uh, the woodsmen work for the firemen when Mr. C is shot and they attempt to release Bob, but then put him back into Mr. C because the time wasn't right. I'm not so well, sure course, about yeah, that that's one. True. That, well, no, he's right that the time wasn't right because um, Freddie oh, McRubberfist was that's, there. Well, that's what he says next. He says Freddie wasn't there to, with his Hulk glove to break Bob into the shards that would go, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to go uh, to the, break Bob into the shards that would go back to the Black Lodge. Yes. And then he says, notice when Richard and Carrie enter Twin Peaks, the entire town is empty. No cars, no people around as if the darkness took over and made it a living grave. Ugh. Yeah, that's kind of morbid. Uh, what if Alice Tremond, the owner of the Palmer House, is the wife of Mrs. Tremond's grandson, the magician? We kind of, well, we kind of speculated, but that the husband might be the magician or, you know, magic kid grown up. Yeah, magic kid. Yeah, that's true. I like that. Yeah. But again, what year is it? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, what year is this? Could there be a link between the Chalfonts, Tre Tremons, and the Horns slash Martells? I'm not sure about oh, that. Oh, like two great houses? Maybe. Oh, yeah, maybe. Uh, when Hawk points to the fire on his ancient Nez Pierce map, uh, Nate Pierce, uh, he says that electricity, electricity could be used for good or evil. Laura is that fire electricity that came from the firemen. And she can be both good and evil. Yeah, maybe. Uh, the fireman is the angel Lucifer, which means the light bearer, uh, which is passed to Laura, which explains the light when she removed her face. And it, it was it was Lucifer who was banished to the sea of nothingness in the plane of non-existence. And the whole series about is about erasing the death of Bob, Beelzebub in parentheses, and Laura Palmer in parentheses, who is the Antichrist spawned by the fireman. Laura mm -hmm. was Laura was supposed to be possessed by Bob to end Lucifer's exile by becoming one with Judy to excuse me, to end the existence of everything. I told you this was a long uh, manifesto. Uh, the alarm in the fireman's throne room let him know that the seal was broken to release the Antichrist, a.k.a. Laura. P.S. Senorita Dido, Zan's favorite, My favorite, is Lucifer's bride as Dido killed herself in Carthage. Google Dido in Carthage. And sentenced herself to hell. Also, the fireman is old as hell and has on a smoking jacket. And during the Trinity test, along with the Jack Parsons sex magic ritual to invoke the mother of abomination, the experiment spewed the entities slash demons into the convenience store. This evil began to slowly take over the Black Lodge and town of Twin Peaks, influencing everyone's lives in some negative way. This evil also possessed Mike, who had to cut off his arm to be free from it. Mike seemed like the only Black Lodge entity to really try to help Agent Cooper prevent the end of existence, however, was thwarted back on the path of destruction by the firemen. He's put a, I, lot, of, he's put a lot of thought into this. I do, and I like the amount of thought he's put into it. I like the theory. It's just, it's so mm. negative. Yeah. I find the negativity upsetting. Yeah. Uh, during Doesn't Agent... Mean doesn't mean he's wrong. Yeah. I find it upsetting. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hopefully there be more positivity here. Yeah. Uh, during Agent Jeffrey's Blue Rose case, he came across a criminal syndicate and was pushed through time to the future when he had dealings with Mr. C in Buenos Aires. Then was pulled back in time to FBI headquarters when when he was then introduced to Agent Cooper in Fire Walk With Me. He then became trapped in the time machine, and he speaks to both Mr. C and Cooper as if they're one and the same. One and? The same. The same. Yep. The fireman then pits Mr. C and Agent Cooper in a race to find the, quote, Grand Central Station of Time Portals to go back in time to undo the death of Laura, Mr. C. Or, excuse me, to undo the death of Laura. Hmm. And then Mr. C and Cooper are both in the dark about Judy. Agent Cooper was on a mission to stop Judy by taking Laura and placing her in a different timeline, thus preventing Laura from ever putting on the ring. I believe that Nido, who then turned into Diane, was Judy, and Diane was dead the whole time. What? Yeah. This is where he kind of loses me. Uh, Diane's tulpa was so traumatized by her own torture and death by Mr. C... And when Nido slash or parentheses Judy turns into Diane, her hair and nails resemble the waiting room of the Black Lodge, not the fireplace space station. That's true. That when, is true. When Agent Cooper and Diane drive to the motel, they perform ritual sex magic to invoke the Moon Child to open the portal for the future, to the future for Agent Cooper only. Diane parentheses Judy does not follow, hence her seeing her own double before the ritual and the note left in the morning by Richard for Richard by Linda. Interesting. Yep. Again, this is an interesting theory that I, that I like hearing, but it just makes me sad. Yeah. Uh, Cooper, it's too Cooper then takes Carrie page back to twin peaks, assuming he has defeated Judy by stealing Laura away. Laura and Sarah no longer live at the Palmer house because Leland killed himself a year after Laura's disappearance. And Sarah was killed by her own doppelganger that was living with her. That's the sound Hawk heard in the house when he questioned Sarah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Cooper, Cooper, unaware that the Palmer house is now the epicenter, reunites Judy with Laura Palmer, thus collapsing space-time, wiping us out of existence. Well, that's nihilistic. Well, I can see where he's going with that, where Laura, you know... Laura finally pick, finally picks up on it and screams, and then we're we're in the dark. Yeah. So I can see where he's coming with that. Right. Uh, while Cooper is trapped in the time machine, reliving the past, is it future or is it past? Mm-hmm. Uh, the last scene is Laura whispering in Cooper's ear that, that she is now Judy, since Cooper. Not it was my father who killed me. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, since Cooper took Laura before she put the ring on, uh, Laura's death. Well, when she put the ring on, kept the world spinning by taking her before she, by taking her p- before she put the ring on and then reuniting her with Judy completed the possession and our path to darkness slash nothingness, which is echoed in a scream at the very last scene. Ah, again, very nihilistic here. Uh, very much so. Uh, Cooper failed his mission and was fooled into thinking the Black Lodge was helping him. They pretty much went the same direction as the Sopranos ending when Tony fades to black. And then Journey says, don't stop believing. Yeah, yeah. Bottom line, Agent Jeffries had the chance, one chance to go back in time and ward Gordon Cole, but didn't see how the big picture. So now he is stuck in the time machine. Like Agent, literally in the machine. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, he's, he's the tin machine, remember? He's the tin machine. Yeah, he's literally in the machine. Yep. Uh, Agent Cooper had two chances to save Laura and ended up fulfilling the end of the world prophecy and is now stuck in the time machine as well. Repeating the loop, re- repeating the loop in the waiting room. The moment Cooper's big head appears in part 17 is the moment he made the decision to go back in time, which created a butterfly effect in a way. Okay. My theory on the sound before <laughs> Laura vanishes came to me when I saw the first, very first episode of Twin Peaks season one. Audrey is giving the secretary a hard time by twisting her pencil into her coffee cup before pouring it out and having the coffee spill out. It makes the same sound. That squeaky styrofoam is what he's hitting at. It does. That's true. It does. See, I, I thought it sounded more like an insect. 
personally. But I can see where I can see where he's getting that. Right. See, I was thinking it was like the bug, the insect, the noise from the the bug that went into young Sarah Palmer. Yeah. That's what I, I think I that's think. probably what it was, but maybe that's my theory. Maybe they're supposed to be reminiscent of each other as well. Yeah. I don't know. Another theory I have is that all the Loras we see scream and fly up in the air are all doppelgangers until the end when Cooper finds the real Laura. My thor- hmm. my theory on uh, how many more theories does he have here? Oh, we're almost done. Okay. My theory sorry sorry, Chris. Uh my theory on the Mr. C, Dougie Coop, and Agent Cooper is basically Lynch showing us that no matter how we act, either evil or good, we are all eventually Dougie Coop being pushed through time whether we want to or not. If we are lucky, Jade will give us two rides. Jade, I'll bet she did. <laughs> yep. She, Jade give two rides. I'll bet she did. Yep. So that was very lengthy uh, theories from Chris. So thanks, Chris. Yes, thank you for for the theory. I like I said, AKA, I, I AKA like Medicine Dog seventy seven. So AKA Chris Isaac. AKA Chris <laughs> Isaac. So that's what that's what I'm going to believe that this Chris Isaac. Yep. I like the thought that was put in a theory, and I find the theory interesting. It just it makes me too depressed to hope to want it to be true. Yeah. So. <laughs> I think I think some of those theories are are valid. I, I'm not sure the entire thing is. So true. Uh, but again, this true, is but... this is right now. This is open to interpretation. So every theory is valid at this point. I think. True. But yes, until, until we get that. until we get some kind of confirmation that contradicts that. Uh, until Mark Frost and David Lynch tell us for yeah. for yay or nay. So they need to yeah. do that right now. Yeah. At least write another book, Mark Frost. Just say write another book, Mark Frost, please. Yep. Yep. Which is fun to live in this All world. Right. So, uh, so that's it. Um, obviously, that was a lot. Um, but uh, thanks to but Chris. For, thanks yeah, to thanks Chris for writing in. Perfect. And um, if you want to be like Chris and you want to, you got some theories of your own, um, please feel free to write in. Uh, you can reach us at ghostwoodpodcast at gmail.com if you want to drop us a line like Chris did. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And. Um, or if you want to reach us on the Twitter machine, you can reach us at Ghostwood Cast, or on our Facebook page, Ghostwood the Twin Peaks Podcast. So uh, please like us and follow us there. That would be awesome. Yes, and, please. And then, of course, we're on iTunes, and uh, we'd definitely appreciate that if you uh, rated us and uh, you know that subscribe helps to subscribe us. to us as well. Yes, thank you, because that helps people find us. And uh, please tell your friends about us if you're so inclined, because we definitely appreciate that as well. We'll be around more often because, you know, there's no more two week trips to Australia coming up. <laughs> soon. Yeah, exactly. And we got the holidays coming up so we can try to get back on track now. Yeah, we're going to be we're going to want to be stuck in the house and doing nothing. Yep. And hey, you look, you know, just happen to have that that spiffy new season three set. So up, Charles? just kidding. Just saying. Go away, Richard. But look at, the, at Laura. She's so pretty. Oh, it's Laura in the gold ball. Yep. She's uh, so pretty. Yep. Bezos! <laughs> Shakes fist. <laughs> but, uh, he's the only Amazon that didn't end up on Paradise Island. Um, and, you know, for good reason. He is male. That's Seriously. That would be why. That would probably be why. Yep. yep. Um... So, uh, apart from that, uh, so Zan, where can they find you on the interwebs? I am on Twitter as Udinax19. And I am on Facebook as Zan Sprouse. And I just was told that my privacy settings have me being, me, me seeming very standoffish. Yes. So I'll be trying to check my other inbox a little bit more often now. So Okay. That sounds good. Yes. All right. What about you, Charles? You'd be a little more sociable. That's awesome. Well, I didn't know. It, somebody said I tried to friend someone, and they said, "Well, I wasn't sure because I didn't see any photos." I was like, "What? You should yeah. be able to see photos." And so I. Uh, With Facebook, it's hard to tell because they're always kind of screwy. Yeah, that's they, true. They change stuff. Um, yeah. As as for me, uh, of course, I'm at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine, at Charles Skaggs on the Instagram. 
Uh, Google Plus for all you crazy kids of the Google Plus. And Facebook, of course, at Charles Skaggs. And my blog, Geeky Things. If the button will work. It's not working. Why are you no work? Push the button for it. Damn good coffee. And hot. There you go. Operator error, as always. Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about all the stuff we cover here on the Twin Peaks podcast, Ghostwood, uh, including uh, also uh, other things, any David Lynch things that are related, also comic book and sci-fi goodness, and my other talk about my other two podcasts. Uh, Congrats fan- on 100 episodes. Yes, yes. 100 episodes of Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, which uh, just released today. And with Jesse Jackson and uh, the Fandom Zone podcast that I do with Karen Lindsay, where we talk about all the comic book shows on television. And Lord Almighty, there are a plenty these days. There's tons of them. Tons of them. So, uh, so please check out the Fandom Zone podcast as well, because that would be like fantastic. I would like to put a shout out to say you guys need to give a good review to Runaways. To what? I'm sorry, of- I look, got a little distorted there. You need to review and give a good review to Runaways. Oh, yes, yes. Now, I have actually watched Runaways. I don't know if Karen has. Okay. But I enjoyed it. I'm enjoying it so far. I know that episode five, I think, gets posted today. Well, the reason I'm saying that is because one of the guests, one of the other guests at the convention I was at in... James Marsters. was James Marsters, yes. yes. And... I was in Australia because my husband, Chris Browse, is a comic book artist, and he was a guest of the show. Right. And one of the things that we did was we had this cocktail party afterwards where everybody could sort of mingle, have drinks and finger food, and fans who paid for the VIP package could go and mingle with the guests of the convention. And James Marsters walked around mingling with everybody he saw like it was his job. I mean, he was the sweetest, most personable, outgoing guy. He knew, and he knew how to work the room. room. Just, and just so willing to start up a conversation with anybody. That's good. And that was, you know, and we were, we were just sitting there. And when he found out that Chris was a guest of the show, he's like, what are you sitting here for? Go talk to fans. <laughs> and we're sitting there going like, they're here to talk to you, dude. Yeah. So, well, it's, um, it's funny. I, obviously, uh, yeah, I, I became a James Marsters fan, obviously, on Buffy the Vampire Slayer when he played Spike. Right. But then also, you like, he was on Torchwood as Captain John Hart. And then he was also uh, on Smallville as Brainiac. Yes, he was. And a bunch of other places. So, yeah. So I'm a big James Marsters fan. But James Marsters, um, and that's the thing, when you go to a comic convention, if you want to talk to one of the artists, you usually can. There's, you know, they're, they're doing sketches. They're, they're, they're at their table for a long time and they can be signing autographs and sketching and talking to you at the same time. And it's a little bit different with the media guests. They're, They're getting, you're getting routed through like a herd of cattle. So, much, yeah. you know, the fact that he, that he was able to just, like I said, even after hours on off time, just work the room and talk to the fans. Like it was any other cocktail party. I, he has so much respect in my heart now for that. Yeah. So yeah. support That's, any James Marsters project you see, because he's is, a genuinely good guy. That is a sign of a true professional. I think. I think so too. I think so too. And he, he didn't act like he was, he didn't act like it was drudgery. And for me, it would have been terrifying, a terrifying thing to strike up conversations with strangers. Right. <laughs> but he did it like it was his job. It was amazing. It was very, very sweet. And Chris had been at a convention with Marsters about 20 years ago when Buffy was still on. And it was unfortunately a show that not many people went to that right. didn't have a lot of attendance. So the artists were all just doing sketches for each other. And Marsters was with was in the same room with the artists and just talking to them, asking what they were working on, looking at the sketches, just, they were all just hanging out, like just guys at a guys in a room. And Chris has always said that he was a really good guy from that as well. And what was funny at the time is yeah. Buffy was still filming. Yeah. So he's there with the bleach blonde hair, and he's got a lot <laughs> but James Marsters is, is, is American. You're right. So he has an American accent. So to see him look like, it's really weird to hear him with a, his normal accent because but, and, and to see him look like Spike, but sound sound American was just sort of like, what is this cosplay? I mean, what's going on? Here? Yeah. No, but yeah. I, can, I as as someone who does watch Runaways on Hulu, um, yeah, I can definitely recommend him. I mean, his his character is definitely has the punchable face, but That's- 
I like characters like that. Yeah, well, that's 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 his character. Awesome. Uh, he, he plays a character called Victor, and uh, who's one of the dads, and who's of course one of the dads who turns out to be, you know, super villain. And uh, so yeah, he's he's great, and he's also kind of a he's like one of the like he's more abusive toward his son on the show. Oh, so yeah, so he yeah he definitely has a very punchable face, and he's arrogant about it. So, oh my gosh, and he's great at he's great at playing that too. Yes, he yeah. is. Yes, he is. If you ever watch him as Spike, yeah, you'll know what he is. And also as John, Captain John and Hart. even as and as John Hart as well. Yep. Yeah, you're yep. like, like oh damn it, him again. Let's watch. <laughs> But he's yeah, he definitely is fun to watch. So definitely check him out. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think that about does it. Next time, we're obviously we're going to talk about Twin Peaks: The Final Dossier. Yep. And uh, so go bone up on that. I'm going to go finish it, and uh, and then we'll come back come back here in a couple of weeks and we will talk about it. Yes, we will. As we get back on track at last. So thanks everybody for listening to Ghostwood, and uh, we'll see you next time right here on Ghostwood Twin Peaks Podcast. Out. Hey, everybody.